This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Seeing that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm going to call the meeting to order. We have now been told we are on the air. Um, we, we're starting this meeting early tonight in hopes of getting several things done before we have our posted hearing at 6.30. Um, I just want to note that on your agenda are the times for the school committee um, candidate interviews and selection. I also want to note and ask that you join me tomorrow at 10 o'clock a.m. for the Tibet Day, um, Free Tibet Day Flag Raising Proclamation and March. I don't know that I'll march, but I'll be there otherwise. Um, and also just note our upcoming meetings on March 21st, 23rd, April 6th, and April 27th. And those are in addition to the meetings for the school committee. Um, we are going to try to pack as much as we can into this first half hour. Um, so we've concluded one and two. We're moving on to general public comment. Is there anyone here who would like to make general public comment? Okay, I may come back to that later because I, it's, it's normally a 6.30 item. Uh, the second thing is our proclamation for Tibet Day. Please come forward. And introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak before the town council. Uh, my name is Thondup Tsering, and I'm the president of the Regional Tibetan Association of Massachusetts. Um, today, I would like to give you a quick update on the situation on Tibet. As many of you may well be aware, inside Tibet, the occupation and repression continues to this day. The recent 2020 Freedom House report for the fifth year in a row placed Tibet as the second least free region in the world after Syria. The 2019 World Press Freedom Index published by the Reporters Without Borders lists China at 177 out of 100 countries next to Eritrea, North Korea, and Turkmenistan. The 2020 Human Rights Watch reports highlights the threat to Tibetan language as China forcibly uh, forces a politically motivated bilingual education policy in Tibet. In 2016, Tashi Wangchuk, a Tibetan language activist, was arrested and sentenced to five years in prison. On January 27th of this year, nearly a thousand writers, linguists, translators, and language activists signed the open letter issued by the Pan America calling for his immediate release. Since 2009, 154 Tibetans have self-immolated, the latest being a 24-year-old Yunten from the Ngaba region who passed away on November 26, 2019. The situation in occupied Tibet is grim to say the least. Outside occupied Tibet, the support for Tibet, or the right of the Tibetan people to live in their own country and be able to practice their culture and way of life is growing steadily. As you may recall, two years ago, the first standalone bill on Tibet, the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, was passed with bipartisan support and became a law on December 19, 2018. This bill was sponsored by Congressman Jim McGovern and takes direct aim at the Chinese government's unfair treatment of Americans, including Tibetan Americans from the Amos, Amherst region. In October 2019, during his official visit to Dharamsala, U.S. Ambassador Brownback 
reiterated the United States' support for His Holiness and the Tibetan people. Ambassador Brownback called on China to immediately release the 11th Panchen Lama, who was forcibly abducted and has been missing for the last 25 years. The ambassador also endorsed the resolution on the reincarnation adopted by the 8th International Conference of Tibet Support Group and the 3rd Special General Meeting held last year. The 14th Tibetan Religious Conference also stated that His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who is now 84 years of age, is the sole authority concerning his reincarnation. Both the Dutch and Belgian government have also expressed their strong support in this regard. In a momentous event early this year on January 28th, the Tibet Policy and Support Act was passed with an overwhelming bipartisan support in the United States House of Representatives. And this bill again addresses and reiterates the fact that the Tibetan community, the Buddhist world, and the Dalai Lama himself has the right to recognize the next Dalai Lama. I, on behalf of the original Tibetan Association, would like to thank, again, Congressman Jim McGovern for sponsoring this major landmark Tibetan bill. This bill is currently in the Senate, and I'm happy to report today that both Massachusetts Senators, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Senator Markey, are both co-sponsors of this bill. Locally here in the Poynia Valley, Tibet continues to re receive strong support from the community and elected officials. On behalf of the members of the local Tibetan community, I take this opportunity to thank Senator Joe Comerford, Representative Mindy Dome, Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, the Amherst Town Council Manager, Amherst Town Council, Northampton Mayor, and the Northampton City Council for their continued strong support for Tibet. I want to thank the Town Council for supporting the Tibet Day and thank you Dalai Lama Year proclamation. We invite you to join us either for the flag raising ceremony or for the walk from Amherst to uh, Northampton starting tomorrow at 10 a.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, GOL, do you have a report? GOL met on February 26th and uh, declared the proclamation to be clear, consistent, and actionable by a vote of four to zero with one absent. Is there any council question or discussion at this time? Seeing none, then um, could I have a motion to adopt the 2020 Amherst Tibet Day Proclamation as voted at GOL 2020 on 20-26, in other words, February 26th, clean. And second? Okay. Is any further discussion? Then all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Athena, do I give him one copy? Yes. Okay. There you go. See you tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to go on to um, discussion item six, which I anticipate being very brief, and then we'll come back to public comment, okay? Uh, so in your packet, you received an updated um, set of information regarding the um, school committee vacancies. Uh, this continues to be an evolving document. We did release the announcement um, last Tuesday, and uh, I am in the process of collecting questions. Even since you received the questions uh, in your packet, I've received one more. Those questions, as you see them, are just as people are giving them to me. They are not the final questions. It is a suggestion of questions. And the school committee chair and I will get together, come up with a proposed final set of questions for you, and bring them forward to the council. Are there questions about the process to date? Yes, Mandy Jo. I had questions about how, when you get together with the school committee chair, how you're choosing the questions, how many you might be choosing, 
things like that. Um, we're certainly that, open. To, are we going to know them in advance which ones you have chosen? Things like yes. that. We would we would come up with a set of draft questions and bring it back to this body at our next meeting. And my sense would be that we would follow pretty much what OCA has done with a sense of you know seven or eight questions, that kind of thing. I did try to group them to give you a sense of the general areas of the questions. And so as you continue to give me ideas for questions, if you feel there's other areas uh, that we should be raising questions in, please set, tell me that in your emails. Okay? We want to make sure that the questions are stated without bias and also without a preconceived notion. And also, so they're not just yes and no questions that we get a sense of the candidates. Okay? Any other questions about this? Okay, then moving on. Um, the, um, now, are there people here who are here now for general public comment? General public comment in this case does not apply to the hearing that's coming up on Lincoln Avenue to item 7C on the agenda or 7G. It's just general public comment. Please come forward, state your name, and where you live, and also keep your comments to three minutes. Yep. Thank you. Maybe two. Meg Gage, District 1. Um, I was clearing up some of my Charter Commission things and came across a really important memo that Mandy wrote, and I've got her permission to share this with you. One of the things the Charter Commission struggled with and talked a lot about but weren't really able to fully um, resolve was what is meaningful and authentic participation. And Mandy did this amazing nine-page memo that is characteristic of her work ethic, her open-mindedness, and her attempt to find middle ground solutions. Uh, and I am sending it to you since I know you're paper free uh, as soon as I get home. And so you can see it. It's got um, a, a lengthy bibliography at the end. And particularly interesting, uh, I think, is the uh, Archon Fung's uh, Democracy Cube, where he takes three different, there are many different axes, so I don't want to get into too much detail because there's, there's a lot of research on participation. But he looks at the combination of communication and decision making as one grid. The second is authority and power, and the third is who participates. And all, the, all of those intersect with each other, so I think you'll find that, and he's created the concept of a cube, so three-dimensional. Uh, there are, she talks about um, participatory budgeting, about um, uh, deliberative polling, uh, 21st century town meetings, I, I would add jury, uh, citizen juries and study circles, and these are all approaches that are very well established and there's a lot of information on them. And you've done such a great job this last year putting this whole new government together. Maybe uh, now in your second year, we might all think together about what uh, meaningful participation and how, what we might do. We have three fabulous uh, community participation officers who triple the value that we put into the charter, um, and they're very eager to help. So I am just wanted to, I'll, you'll get this in your box, and thank you for the opportunity. Was that three minutes? Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Any other public comment at this time? OK. Then we're going to move on to the consent agenda, uh, which is item 7A. And before we do the consent agenda, I just want to make sure that nobody wants to remove anything from the consent agenda. Uh, so let me just go ahead and read this, and then we'll move on. Uh, the following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when the president lists the consent agenda items. The request to remove an item from the consent agenda does not require a second. So the various items in this are to move the following items and printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 
7E to suspend town council rules of procedure rule 8.4 for agenda item 7E audit engagement letter to authorize the town council president to execute the audit engage letter indicating acknowledgement of and agreement with the arrangements for Melanson Health Health's audit of this of the town's financial statements and compliance over major federal award programs for FY 2020 as recommended by the Finance Committee. Okay. Uh, to 7F, to suspend count, town council rules of procedure rule 8.4 for agenda item 7F, Mullen rule, Zoning Board of Appeals and Local Historic District Commission. Yes. Uh, I don't know why that we are doing that, so I guess I would want that not to be on the consent agenda. We will agenda. remove that, okay? Uh, that is now officially removed from the consent agenda, and we, we will take it up later as listed in the agenda. Um, and the approval of the February, I'm sorry, yes, to the approval of the February 24th, 2020 Town Council minute, minute, meeting minutes. Any questions on that? Okay, so um, the motion then is to move the following items and the printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. To suspend Town Council Rules of Procedure 8.4 for agenda item 7E audit engagement letter. 7E, to authorize the Town Council President to execute the audit engagement letter, indicating acknowledgement of an agreement with the arrangements for Melanson Health's audit of the Town's financial statements and compliance over major federal awards programs, FY20, as recommended by the Finance Committee. And the third item is 7, I'm sorry, 10A, approval of the February 24, 2020 Town Council meeting minutes as presented. That's a motion, is there a second? second? Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? No? Okay. Um, we will then, believe it or not, go on to 7B. Okay. I'm sorry, 7C. Thank you. We will go on to 7C since we will not start the hearing until 6.30. This is your lucky day, Mr. Sawyer, Dr. Sawyer. <laughs> Slaughter, excuse me. Um, okay, uh, Evan, would you please go ahead and present the amendment as you have in the past? Yes, so you've heard me talk about this now twice, amending our open containers bylaw to create the opportunity for the Board of Licensed Commissioners to promulgate regulations to allow for the sale and distribution um, of alcoholic beverages with a permit um, on public land. Uh, I don't think I need to elaborate on that, um, but I do hope that given the discussions that we've had in the past two meetings, and since then we have seen letters of support from the Amherst Chamber of Commerce and the Amherst Business Improvement District, two organizations that I think um, stand to benefit from, benefit from this as they plan their events and festivals on the town common. Um, so I hope you all will support this tonight. Yes, Dorothy. Well, I initially did support it, but I had thought it was only for uh, large public groups uh, in the community to do something on the town greens. And when I was dis in, through discussion, it was revealed that this could mean in the parks, individuals, families. I, I then began to think the whole thing was going to be like um, letting the genie out of the bottle, and it was going to be too difficult to um, follow. So. Unless it gets, and I've, I've been told that the licensing board will do the limiting, but I don't want to vote on something now that I don't know what the true dimensions are going to be. Um, 
Also, I had brought up that there need to be some standards and maybe deposits uh, or something so that um, if there were any damage or, or pickup or policing of any kind that that would be paid for by the groups. Uh, so, but in theory, I do like your proposal, but it's, it's the details as to who gets the permit for what and where and under what conditions that has me at this moment not able to support this. Would you like to come forward? Thank you. This is Doug Slaughter, who is the chair of our, <clears throat> excuse me, license commission. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, you probably received in your packet literally within the last hour or so because we met this afternoon and we're crafting a letter and I still found a couple of things I'd like to change <laughs> relative to references uh, in that letter. But I think the, uh, the idea behind the letter that you received today was to provide some opportunity for um, uh, an alternative approach. Um, we're certainly, you know, if you pass your uh, amendment by law as is, where it essentially falls completely to the Board of License Commissioners to, to handle the licensing on uh, public spaces, that's certainly fine with us. But uh, what you see in this is memo from us to you is uh, an alternative approach that allows the council to, to be more actively engaged in the process of setting the limits and parameters of, of what might go on in those, in those spaces. And some of this articulates a little bit of what we've had as far as conversations about how we'd want to proceed moving forward anyway. Um, but I think it, it, it uh, potentially could retain some, some authority in the, in the council that might make everyone a little more comfortable moving forward. But again, it's, it's uh, your call either way. Um, one other thing that I was required by Mike colleagues on the, on, the board, on, the, on the commission to say is that it really ought to be a license and not a permit. So if you change it, you should make it a license and not a permit, because it's a short-term license, and this would fall under our short-term licenses. So, um, But I think in general, you know, as I said, we're, we're open to um, sort of fully taking this on if you go with the more simplified version, but also uh, in, the, in the letter we're trying to articulate a, a middle ground that might allow the council to continue to to go back and forth with us a little bit about what the community standards need to be around this kind of a change. Additional council discussion questions. Kathy. Um, I'm just reading the letter now. Thank you very much um, for sending it. Um, my concern, which I expressed last time, was how broad this was um, and not given a sense of under what conditions and where would we uh, put this? And I think this starts to address some of it. I'm not sure how much of the wording you're proposing would be in the bylaw, but I wanted to say that this, to make it clear, this permit is going for an event rather than a person, you know, so it wouldn't be, a, each person could come in and say, today I'm gonna open carry. And when we had, and this was, well, you could do that in your protocols and then we had a discussion on should we start small, uh, for example, the, the commons downtown um, before we think of going up to Mill River or Groff Park. Should we you know, start and see how it works in terms of an uh, ability to oversee it? And so rather than writing it can happen anywhere at any time. Um, so the question would be how much we write in a bylaw uh, to give that kind of guidance and then the protocols would be developed that would follow that um, rather than leave the bylaw so general. And I'm used to seeing more in the legislation to give at least some sense to the people that are then doing protocols and regulations as guidance. So that's, okay. <clears throat> if I may. Um, you know, I, I think our, our thinking with regard to having protocols and sort of working with the council in regard to setting those up allows some flexibility without necessarily fully amending the bylaw every single time you want to make a change to it. And so it, it's an attempt to, you know, strike a middle ground. Um, in, in general, however, any short-term license has to have a responsible person or entity. Uh, and even with an entity, there's still a responsible manager. If you think about a sort of liquor license, generally there's a of responsible manager. So any, any type of, of license we would grant, uh, regardless of, of how this plays out, would, would be and would require it to be um, a, a, an individual e e uh, expressly in charge and responsible. Um, but I think the idea was to keep the bylaw as broad as possible. 
uh, but yet reference the protocols and then the protocols have to be in place for anything to happen and the protocols would be something that would be uh, worked out between, as we suggest, the subcommittee, one of the subcommittees of the, of the council and, and the Board of License Commissioners and then essentially enacted on and worked on with, with the councilors and we'd review on a periodic basis like once a year uh, to see if those work or don't work um, without the need to necessarily continually amend the bylaw. Mm -hmm. um, could, since we did receive the letter, um, could you kind of, in your own words, explain what it is you're looking for from the council based on this letter from the commission? So again, I think if you if you take the the uh, proposal just as is, which is you know um, very broad, we're fine with that. But as as an option to you, the idea would be that you would amend the bylaw. Uh, to have open container, but reference a set of protocols that had to be authorized by a subcommittee of the council and the license commissioners. Those protocols, um, and on the back of this uh, document, uh, you know, articulates a few things that, that might be included. There might be a whole lot more. Um, and then, uh, and any other, you know, if you wanted to put particular conditions in separate from the protocols, then you obviously would have that option as well if you, if you sought that. And of course, we would want any uh, license of this sort to to uh, to be reviewed by the police and fire chief. Um, so there, are, you know, the idea with additional conditions is that a particular circumstance, maybe a time of year, uh, you know, where let's say someone has to want something in the winter, we might consider, you know, uh, conditions of you know snow and ice as part of what we want to factor into what conditions or constraints we might place on, on a licensee, whereas in the summer it may be something different. Um, so you want to have some latitude to add additional constraints to folks in, in these circumstances, so that's one aspect. Um, the idea with the protocols is there's a general base frame of, of uh, requirements that people are going to need to meet um, and, and limitations that we may collectively set as to locations, um, you know, whether we keep the, uh, the service area completely cordoned or not, or to what extent, what kinds of other facilities, amenities, or um, security staffing might be, you know, something we want to have uh, explicitly identified in the protocols and then see how those work. Um, I think we'll know a lot more later. Um, and of course, the idea with the, having the police chief or fire chief and or fire chief weigh in is that um, when you think about crowd control, uh, or crowd size, uh, the viewpoint that each of those folks bring to uh, their, their review, whether it be a, a regular full alcohol license or a short-term license, um, is different. So, you know, one's concerned about uh, crowd management, one's concerned about safe, you know, fire safety and people being able to exit safely. Uh, so those are different sort of views, and that's why we we wanted to include them as well in the conversation as we as move ahead and use their expertise to our advantage. So those are really those sort of three pieces, a set of protocols that work out with you guys to uh, frame the constraints that we're going to operate under, a baseline set of things we're absolutely going to require every single time, limitations on locations, maybe hours, days a week, whatever it is that we decide, potentially other conditions that, that we might impose on a specific license based on the circumstance. Uh, the type of event, the time of year, any number of things I, could, I can imagine there. And then, of course, uh, coordinating with our police and fire chiefs. Shalini. So this, <clears throat> this is regarding the venue and venues, and I believe, uh, or at least I'm aware that there are many UMass events that take place at the Mill River um, Park. And so and many of those are, not many, the ones that I'm aware of are all family events, and I believe they would be enlivened if alcohol was allowed. That's what I've heard. And so these are all family events, and if we have protocols in place, and um, I think it would make sense to allow it in and not restrict where this is applicable. Are there other comments? Yes, Sarah? 
So since Shalini already brought up Mill River, and I live close, we go a lot. So in the summer and spring especially, the place is packed with families. And I will say that there is already some uh, enlivening of family <laughs> events, and often there is a lot of imbibing in a couple different substances that are legal in Massachusetts. So for me, it, it makes me wonder if starting a process where we are, you know, actually licensing things and maybe we're thinking a little bit more about, you know, maybe just checking out what happens there. And I think it might actually be more constructive to things that are already happening, and make them safer. So that's just something that I thought of. Okay. Additional comments or questions? Dorothy? I would like to suggest that we start uh, small before going big. And uh, if we're going to do this open container thing, limit it to the um, downtown parks and to organizations and not to small individual groups and families. And I had originally been very supportive because I thought it was a way to encourage local beers. But I'm really not that interested in encouraging just random drinking. Yes, Evan. So our Board of License Commissioners has been in existence for a little over a year now, and I think we've seen them act in every instance in a way that should instill confidence um, in them. We have seen them promulgate new regulations around BYOB and around uh, food service uh, at alcohol-serving establishments. We've seen them react, I think, very appropriately to uh, a situation in which rules were not being followed, um, and there was concern within the community uh, we have someone who's serving on that committee who has licensing experience from his previous role on the select board. Um, and so I'm finding it hard to stomach uh, this desire to micromanage the Board of License Commissioners. Uh, I think here what I've presented is a clean and broad bylaw that leaves a lot of deference and discretion to the board. Um, and I would hope that we would not try to uh, pick and choose what are our favorite parks that maybe we do or don't want service in um, and let that up to them. Uh, I appreciate the board's memo and their attempt to address our concerns. I have a lot of concerns actually with what's being proposed. I, I don't want counselors brought into promulgating regulations. We don't do that for any other regulations um, for the Board of License Commissioners or for any other regulatory body. Um, and I'm especially concerned about any idea that regulations could change from year to year and that they would only exist for a one-year time span. I think that creates uncertainty for organizations trying to plan in advance and for businesses who might be looking to do this. Um, so my proposal from the beginning and what I stand by is open the door for the Board of License Commissioners. Let them decide what the regulations look like. They have a great track, re track record thus far. Um, and so I think that the best approach here is for us not to spend time trying to figure out where or who or when we want to see this, um, but instead give it to the appropriate body who has the authority to come up with that. Okay. Yes, uh, Alyssa. So you all know that I have pretty strong feelings about this, and as this continues to evolve, I'm trying to look at it a variety of ways. I had no idea Mr. Slaughter was going to have this memo written, and so I was like, ah, now I have to think about changing my mind? What? <laughs> so, yeah, so, because I didn't know this was coming. Um, I, I do want to push back just a little bit, though, on my colleague stating that they have experience. They do have a great track record so far, but they've never had to choose. They've never had to choose who gets a license or who doesn't from the standpoint that the only one-day licenses they've had to give out are to UMass who gets them all the time. They've never had to choose if a new purveyor of alcohol is up to snuff or not. And one-day licenses, luckily, for the Board of License Commission, ABCC gives a lot of discretion to the local body, which actually makes me happy because ABCC has a lot of dumb rules. So it's actually good that we have that, but they, although they have done really good things, and I totally agree with that, they've not yet had this experience. I appreciate that they tried to put on paper, hey, we're, we heard you saying we're concerned about some of these things. One of the things that still isn't on here is how you pick and choose between applicants. And that's something you haven't had to do yet, and that is where things get sticky, right? What's this family event, allegedly, that's a family event, versus some Hartford road race or the Taste of Amherst that we all know. So that's where it gets stickier. 
I also understand what you're saying about, do we really want to insert the council in this process officially or not? I, I, the, yeah, that's complicated too. So I don't think we can resolve this now because obviously we want to move on to our hearing and I don't think we want to expect Mr. Slaughter to come back four hours from now when we're ready to talk about this again. But one of the things I want to just clarify is although you, I believe you'd indicated that with this protocol suggestion that in theory one could add some reference to the protocol to the bylaw itself, just as you suggested that rather than using the term permit, we might as well use short-term license because that's what it is, is that on the other hand, I'm actually saying this, we could authorize the current bylaw without any mention of said protocol, then if you don't actually do any of that, like you don't, it doesn't end up being a council committee, it doesn't end up that we like the protocols, we just change the bylaw again. I mean. When it comes right down to it, that is one of the advantages to being a town council, is that after you go through the couple of readings and you put it on the bulletin board, if they make a mess out of the situation, which I have no reason to believe they would, but if it starts making us uncomfortable in terms of the choices they're making, we can change the bylaw back. So that is actually, that actually in some ways feels better to me than trying to wordsmith the bylaw to the point of saying the guidance that we're trying to give you that you've obviously been responsive to so far is something we have to try and codify within the bylaw itself because I'm just not sure how to do that. Okay. Is there any further dis discussion at this point? <laughs> is it the wish that we move the question or that we refer this to a later time? Yes, I make a motion that we Move the question. Move it, move the question. Okay. To a later time. So, to a later time. We could, after the hearing then, but I don't think. No, no, no. 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 So we, to, to the to another, next meeting. It's either going to go to the next meeting or is another mo a motion to move the bylaw. George. I would like to make a motion to move the bylaw. Okay. Would you please read the motion then? It's to amend general bylaw. The change. Right. With the change. With the change of wording? Okay. I, I can read it just because I have the motion in front of me. So I move to amend general bylaw 3.17, open containers of alcohol, by adding the words, unless a license, therefore, has previously been secured by the Board of License Commissioners, so that the bylaw reads, oh God, you did this to me. No person shall consume any alcoholic beverage, nor possess or transport any open can, bottle, or other container containing any alcoholic beverage outdoors on any town street, sidewalk, way, or public property, including parking lots, parks, schools, playgrounds, recreation areas, and conservation areas, unless a license, therefore, has previously been secured from the Board of License Commissioners. Is any further discussion? Then all those, George? I want to speak in support of it, if I may, just briefly, if that's all right. Please. Um, I, I hear both um, Evan and Alyssa. I like the idea of, I think the Board of License Commissioners is best suited to make these decisions. And as Alyssa's pointed out, if things don't work out, we have the power to change it. So I think we're in a good position here to move ahead. So I'd urge my colleagues to vote for this. Is there any further discussion at this time? I'm just Kathy. quickly, um, but I'm reading the memo as suggesting that we, in the bylaw reference protocols that will be developed, and I don't see why we couldn't add that, that, that we want Would protocols you to be developed. So to conform to protocols developed to govern such short-term lo okay. licenses. Would you please put that in terms of a motion? Okay, um, I make a motion to add to the sentence at the end, uh, so it would read, I think it is a short-term license. A license, therefore, has been previously secured from the Board of License Commissioners that conforms to protocols developed to govern such short-term licenses. Is there a second? The motion dies for last, lack of a second. We're back to the original motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand and say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? Did you get Let's, okay. Okay, all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 
Opposed? And abstain. Athena, would you please tell us what the vote was? It's 10 in favor, one opposed, and two abstentions. Okay. Thank you for joining us this evening. You're welcome. Thank you, and Thank you. we'll try to do our best to do it right. And we'll be hearing from you, I'm sure. Uh, we are now going to um, move on to the public hearing on the proposed parking regulation changes to Lincoln Avenue. And um, let me start by... finding my script. Okay, so let me just provide a little background here. This hearing is governed by a couple different sections. One is by the fact that by section 2.14 of the charter, the town council is, the, is both the water commission, sewer commission, and public ways. In other words, we oversee those. The second piece is in our general bylaws, section 3.14 on parking and delivery, prior to the adoption of the regulations of any subsequent amendment thereto, the town council shall conduct a public hearing notice of the time and place of which and of the subject matter sufficient for identification shall be posted on the town bulletin board for not less than 14 days before the day of the public of the hearing. And notice shall also be published in a newspaper of general circulation in the town once in each of two weeks. The first publication to be not less than 14 days before the day of the hearing. And then finally from our council rules, we actually have a process by which we conduct this hearing. I'll be using that process. Let me state that um, the, um, the notice of the public hearing was on the town bulletin board on February 13th. 2020, or as of February 13th. It was in the Daily Hampshire Gazette from February 17 to 20 and 24 on 2020. The notice was sent to abutters on February 12th, 2020, and written public comment was received and is in the packets. Uh, we received one set of packets that was dated February, I mean, Friday, March 6, 2020, and we have received an updated. So the general format for the hearing is as follows. There will be a presentation of the proposal. Then there will be questions from the counselors. Then the public may ask questions, not speak in favor or against, but just ask questions to clarify. Then the public is asked those people to speak in favor, and you will be limited based on the number of people who plan to speak. You will then ask those people to speak in opposition. Again, you'll be limited based on the number of people who plan to speak. And then we will end with questions of the council. We will not make a decision during the hearing. We will then go back into our regular meeting. And at that point, we will make a decision. The decision could be to grant whatever the petition was. It could be to modify it. It could be to continue the hearing to another time, or it could be to refer the, the decision to a committee of the council. We could also decide not to grant it. So we have a variety of different decisions that we can make, but that will not be made during the hearing. However, when we return to our regular meeting is when we will make that decision. So let's begin with uh, Mr. Bachelman. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, or President. Um, Parking on Lincoln Avenue has been visited and revisited by the town through the select board uh, several times, and it's, it's back again tonight. The uh, concern has been based on public safety concerns in terms of uh, safety for cyclists and drivers on the street. Uh, we met with a group of neighbors and with, the, with two district counselors who asked us to look into this further. Uh, I met with the superintendent of public works and the police chief to review the situation, and we developed the proposal that's in your packet tonight. So tonight we have the superintendent of public works, Gilford, Gilford Mooring, and police chief Livingstone, who if you want to come up to the table. We also have assistant fire chief Olmstead, Jeff Olmstead here, if there are questions about public safety in terms of fire trucks or ambulance service. Um, so our goal tonight is to make the presentation to you. Um, 
answer any questions uh, or concerns you may have, uh, develop any additional information you feel that you need to uh, make an informed decision, uh, and then op listen to any other comments that you choose to make. So I turn it over to Mr. Mooring. Good evening. <clears throat> so this is probably the fifth, fourth, fifth time we've done Lincoln Avenue since we've been here, and we've been here a pretty long time. Um, so <clears throat> there's always been little changes that have been made, always adjustments, always a couple years, five usually at the least. Um, years go by, and people want to make some more changes. So this is about the right time. About the right time. <clears throat> um, that being said, we have a lot of old information, and we have a lot of new information for you. So <clears throat> I just pushed the button. So we come up with some proposals uh, to make some changes. Um, what you see on the left side is what is there now, and on the right side is what we're proposing. Um, and you have to read a little bit to make sure you legend a little bit. So right now, there's basically no parking on Lincoln Avenue north of Amity Street on the west side, and north of Amity Street to Fearing, there's parking, no parking from 8 a.m. to 5, wait, sorry, <clears throat> from McClellan Street to Fearing Street, there's no parking from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and there's open parking from uh, McClellan Street back to Amity Street on the east side. So we're proposing to change that to make it no parking <clears throat> from 8 to 5 on the east side, all the way from Amity to Fearing, and to ha keep the no parking on the west side. Um, so that's what the basic proposal is. We also do some tidying up. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about from the people we've talked to that it's hard to see when people are parked or even when there's not people parked coming out of McClellan Street and Elm Street. And actually when we talk about <coughs> some of the crash data, we'll talk about a little later, the little blue area, that's basically where all the crashes are on the north side of Lincoln Avenue. They're between Elm Street and McClellan Street. Um, there's not a lot of crashes. Uh, there was three years of data looked at. This year was, or 19 was not looked at. It was 18, 17, 16 is my understanding. That's what we looked at. Um, the total of 29 crashes on the whole length of Lincoln Avenue. Uh, but this is probably the cluster between these two streets. Um, <clears throat> and we'll talk more about that later. But we make some adjustments at McClellan so there's no parking on both sides of McClellan Street at Lincoln so people have a better sight line coming out of McClellan Street. Um, we're also uh, proposing making a better sight line clearance at Amity Street. Um, there's a lot of people who park at Amity Street very, or on Lincoln Avenue very close to Amity Street. Uh, it's mostly seems to be people who are staying in some of the housing near that intersection or it could be people who are working um, in town and walk up to the center of town. Uh, we did kind of scope out the uh, people who are parking. Um, the parking tends to be probably grad students who work five days a week at the university. They're not really students because students tend to have schedules where they jam all their classes on Tuesday, Thursday, try to have Monday off and Friday off, but these people are parking consistently on five days a week. Um, so there's probably a majority of people are, are grad students who actually are employees as well. So they're people who are not parking on campus to avoid parking on campus, or they haven't been able to get a permit to park on campus, because I understand there's a permit system for graduate students who work there as well. Um, so this is the, like, like I said, this is a little cl cl crash cluster right there at, between McClellan and Elm Street. Uh, we're not proposing anything different on the south, what we call the south end of Lincoln, which is from Amity back to Northampton Road. <clears throat> so this is the accident breakdown that people were talking about, asking for. There was 29 accidents, <clears throat> six on the south side, 12 on the north side, and in that cluster between Elm and McClellan. We have one accident that's un unaccounted for. The description of where it happened wasn't really clear on the accident report. Um, we also have a couple other little oddities in the accident reports. Some of the addresses on Lincoln Avenue don't exist. 
but if you add a zero or add a number to it, they fall into line with some of the existing addresses. <clears throat> you have seven accidents that were at the Amity Street intersection and three at the Northampton Road intersection. We, uh, we, we pulled this data, and actually we have the ability to pull this data from a state file now, which the police department submits their records to the state and then it's put on this uh, system. Uh, we just need a little more time if we want to pull more information off because there's also information about types of accidents. So we didn't, weren't able to pull all that information together for you. So if they were all rear end accidents, that's indicative of people who aren't really paying attention and people stopping fast and someone rear ending it. If they were all head on intersection, head on accidents, that's another indication of something, another different problem. If they're all glancing or side impacts, that's another indication of another problem. We weren't able to break that down, so I can't answer that question because I know someone's going to ask that. All of the errors were at the state level, I believe. <laughs> well, it, it, it is a lot of, it's a lot of data to go through, and I imagine whoever was entering the data, because it's all hand entered into the system. There's a quick clarifying question. Steve? What's the this is three years, eight, uh, 19, no, 18, 17, 16. Thank you. The clarifying question on this one? Uh, that would be take more time to feel, figure that out. Um, this database actually has just been made available in the last six months to us, and we're still just trying to play around with it and get all the information off of it. And so there's no. It might be misleading it's, in terms uh, of the number of accidents elsewhere in town. It may. Uh, Darcy, did you have a question? That was, that was what I was going to ask. Okay. Dorothy. So, this data ends at 19, 2019, um, and there's been a strong feeling that's been a great increase in accidents in the last year. Uh, would we be able to get a comparison of the more recent years with these other years? The chief says he can pull that up. We can pull that up within a matter of a day or so. Okay. So this is the breakdown of accidents. We have one accident with an embankment, which I assume was during the winter. They probably ran into a snowbank. Two people hit parked cars, 26 collisions with moving vehicles, and there are no pedestrian or cyclist accidents. So the, we actually did get our, we actually had to go get new traffic counters, but we put traffic counters out and we did a, a tr quick traffic study. Um, and this is sort of the, um, this overall time period and the view of how the traffic flows. You'll see there's distinct peak, peaks. Uh, the morning the peak happens going into campus and then the afternoon the peak is coming out of campus. The average daily traffic is 1,960 vehicles a day. That's down a thousand vehicles from when we did the when we did counts in 2005. So before we put the speed the speed tables in the speed cushions the speed humps um, <laughs> speed bumps uh, <clears throat> before we put the vertical speed control measures in that's the better <laughs> word for it. Uh, we were getting around 3,000 vehicles a day and the speeds were pretty high. Um, J uh, Jason, the town engineer, wasn't able to pull that data up what the speed was, but it was over 35 miles an hour at that time. Um, so this is the, uh, we've cut about 1,000 vehicles a day out of the path, and that could be because of what we did or it could be because of changes at the university. And then this is a quick breakdown of speeds. If you look on the right, the speed limit's 30 miles an hour. The average speed was 19. The fastest speed was 47. The lowest speed was 7. Out of that, this, this device we're using now is actually kind of geared towards uh, enforcement people. So it actually tells you how many violations were probably enforceable. So there were only 10 people who were over the 30 miles an hour. And then so what they would rate as a low enforcement area because of the, these characteristics. In the time period we did it, we got 5,700 vehicles passed through the, the time area. <clears throat> we started after 10 o'clock on Monday, which as you can see is 9.56, and we finished before, a little after 10 on the 5th. 
So we actually didn't get the morning rush on one day and we didn't get the afternoon rush on another day. So what we're proposing again, is a change basically between McClellan and Amity Street to make that no parking from eight o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the afternoon. And mostly it's the deal, it probably will help with the accident cluster that's happening between Elm and McClellan. Um, we also had a lot of reports from cyclists who ride up and down Lincoln Avenue saying that um, it's very difficult to ride with the parked cars and the traffic, traffic that's out there during the day. So if you remove the parked cars, bicycles would only have to deal with the moving cars and would have a little more room to do it. Um, personally, this would not be a road that I would actually put parking on. It's too narrow. I would leave parking off one side. Um, but then again, this is a residential street. It's not meant to be a commuter route to the university. And if it was a residential street, just a residential street, there would be parking on one side. So that's my, my personal opinion and how I would personally look at this. Um. Any further comments from either chief or you? Okay. Counselor questions at this time. Mandy Jo. So my first question just has to do with the map because when I read the regulations and when I look at the Nelson Nygaard downtown parking report, it disagrees with the restrictions that you've depicted specifically between Amity Street and Elm Street on the west side. The Nelson Nygaard report that was just completed four months ago says that that is unrestricted parking right now on the west side. And the memo we got that has regulations to be repealed doesn't say anything about west side parking between Amity and Elm other than 30 feet south of Elm to Elm being restricted as a no parking zone. So I have, I, I'm curious what that regulation actually is because if it is as you say, then the Nelson Nygaard report is wrong and all of their statistics are wrong then because they counted parking there as part of the downtown parking. And if they're right, then what we've got in front of us is a change and some of the statistics about what parking we would be losing are wrong. So if I could get some clarification as to whether between Amity and Elm on the west side is currently actually a no parking zone. It currently is a no parking zone. We went back through the regulations, we pulled some things up. There's actually some conflicting data, um, conflicting regulations, and, but this is no parking and it's always been no parking. One of the other issues we have in this area and throughout the entire town is we have a high, a high incidence of sign theft so signs vanish and then things get left open and when they're left open and not marked, they're interpreted being one thing when there's a, when there's a conflict in the regulations. But the town engineer went back through everything and he's pretty confident and we went through it several times that there's never been parking allowed on the west side of Lincoln between Amity and, and the college, university. Okay, Sarah. I'm actually glad that, that Mandy brought that up because I actually had three phone calls from my precinct, which is very far away, about people saying that they actually parked there and that they felt that it was like some of the only unrestricted parking there is and that they were able to do it without getting a ticket. So I'm wondering if people are parking there, that they do think it is, and then maybe because it hasn't, I don't know, not enforced, or people think they can, then does that change some of the statistics? No? No, if they were parking on the west side of Lincoln, A, we would have been called by a resident, and they would have been ticketed and towed. It's just there's no way you could possibly park on both sides of the street and adapt to, to traffic. Right. <clears throat> Steve. So for me, this shouldn't be an issue of this particular street, but this should be an issue regarding the town policy on parking of streets based on the curb to curb, like how much roadway there's available for parking. So I think it's, to me, it's a problem that this has become sort of a Lincoln Avenue issue because I, I, I think that um, this issue exists many other places and I'm happy to provide. It's not, oh, wait a second. Oh. 
So I think this issue exists many other places. So to my knowledge, this is 23 feet curb to curb. Yes? I, I think it's 30. We were just trying, that's what we were just talking. I think our citations say 30 feet. Yeah. Yeah. But so I went, so I've <laughs> become a citizen traffic engineer. So I've started measuring rights of way on mm -hmm. Churchill Street where the police parking lot exits is, to my knowledge, 30 feet. It is. And it um, has parking on both sides, so I've never heard complaints about that. Smith Street, I think, is 20 feet or even less, and has parking on one side. So to me, to me, we need um, more of a guideline on what the expectation is on town streets, and I think the town needs to be aware that your street may have these restrictions coming on. In other words, to me, this is kind of precedent setting. If we if we change this, that um, that means that every street of this right of way might have parking on one side or on no sides because of the concerns about traffic flow. Okay. Kathy. Um, I, I think this is a, a, a type of follow-up on Steve's question. It's I'm looking at the existing and proposed. Um, if I move one street over from Lincoln, Sunset, you know, um, thinking of if we move cars off of one street, do they end up on another street? And Sunset's got... Um, at least what we've seen so far, no changes. There's no parking on either side up until Elm, and then it's green going over on the way to Amity. So, you know, I know we only asked you to give us a recommendation on Lincoln, but thinking about this surrounding set of, um, is this also, does this become the new throughway, or is it so narrow would you do no parking on one side of that at least, you know, where you can park on both? It looks, from the map, you can park on both sides of Sunset. It's just down the hill a bit, so people probably prefer Lincoln, um, depending on where they're going. So it's, it's the overflow issue of where else you might want to if you were trying to get to right. UMass. I think that's logical. I think we'll expect that'll happen. Sunset is the only place that people who are displaced from Lincoln can really go to, that little stretch of Sunset. Um, the parking on Sunset has not been a problem in a while. Um, it may become a problem, like, like you think, but it's, it doesn't go all the way through to Amity Street, for one. It's a little bit harder to get on the Sunset. Um, if you want to go from Sunset and drive straight through to campus, it's a little more difficult. And we were doing a lot of studies in earlier on, Sunset was not the preferred travel route to go to the campus, so people didn't really even think about driving right. driving down that way. Yeah, I agree with Gilbert. I don't think it necessarily would become the new thoroughfare to UMass because of the problems um, down th through the dormitory area, but it's likely it would become a parking area, yes. Am I correct? Am I correct that there are speed bumps on all of Sunset? Sunset and Lincoln, yes. Yes, okay. Mandy Joe. No, Evan, I, I want to follow up with this size, and if the cars move, Sunset is probably no wider than Lincoln, so would we be facing in another three months or six months a request from the town to say, well, we need to now completely limit one side on sunset and no eight to five on another because we now have a safety issue on there. And if we wouldn't be, why is it a safety issue on Lincoln but not on sunset? And a similar question is, why is it a safety issue on the north side of Amity on Lincoln but not on the south side of Amity on Lincoln where those cars are parked in front of those houses closest to Amity on the south side on the east side of Lincoln on the south side of Amity to go to town. So I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out where your um, decision on what a safety issue is and what it is not falls. So uh, we, were given a, we were given a small area to look at. So no, we did not go look at sunset. We did not go beyond sunset. We can do that. And to tell the truth, to actually come up and say we need to change some parking regulations on a lot of streets downtown would make life much easier for many of us who do things in this town. Um, there's several streets which are parking on one side and are two-way streets, which should 
there's no way you can get two-way traffic down the street and have a car parked on the road. Someone has to stop and let the other car pass. Gaylord is one. Gaylord is so narrow, you cannot have parking in two-way traffic. Um, there's another one, Selen? Selen Dickinson, as already mentioned, I mean. Churchill, yes. Yep. So there, there are streets in town, but in the past, and what we're seeing is, even when we talk about this, you're gonna get one soon for Kendrick Place, which is shown on this one here. Kendrick Place has no restricted parking. Kendrick Place, it's the one down off Northampton Road, has all of a sudden become the primo parking spots for some people. There's parking on both sides of the road there now. Um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's hard to get through there sometimes. So <clears throat> there is no, I have not, since I've been here, found a rhyme or reason sometime why a, a place is a key parking area and then stops being a key parking area. It seems to be the preference of the people who are parking there. They think they, they, they like it, they will park there. Um, there was a parking problem over by the high school and they thought it was the high school students. Well, it wasn't. It was UMass students who were actually students who would park there and walk to the bus stop. And that walk from the high school to the bus stop was shorter than going to Lincoln Avenue and walking in or any of the other ones. And it was more convenient for them. But then that group of students left and the parking problem went away again. <clears throat> now the parking problem is just the high school students again, which is a nicer problem. Um, so the parking in this town changes and moves around constantly. I, I guess I have a, a, a yeah, I want to give Evan a chance to ask his question. Yeah, I, I would yield, yield to Pat. Oh, I, Pat. Mandy Jo largely asked what I had curi was curious about. So Okay, Pat? I, I just had trouble with what you said in terms of the college students and having the high school students doing the same thing as a ni nicer people or a nicer kind of problem. And I don't get that, and it really bothered me. Do you want me to explain that? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> the college students start as soon as school starts. The high school problem doesn't start as soon as school starts because you get a new group of students at the high school, they're all under age, they can't drive. And as the school year goes on, they start getting more and more drivers. So the problem builds at the high school. It's not really a nicer problem, but the problem starts out minor, and then as the school year goes on, it gets more intense because now more people have turned 16 and a half and they can drive their car to school. And because they don't wanna pay for a parking permit for a full school year when they're only using it for half a year, they park on the side streets in the neighborhoods. So the parking problem for the high school is far different than the parking problem the UMass students. A UMass student comes here, the UMass student's 18 years old usually. The UMass student's been driving and will drive. That's why there's a, a little difference between the two populations, between a UMass student or Amherst College student and a high school student. Yes, please. But there's still parking there and we actually do allow them to park on those side streets, right? I know we have at least one counselor, if not two, living in that area by the high school. So I guess I'm still struggling with what's the difference between those side streets where we allow parking during the day for those going to the high school and Lincoln. There really, there really is only <clears throat> the desire of the residents at the time to try to, to correct a problem they think they have. There are times when it's more of an issue of safety, and we can sometimes see that, but it is really sometimes the perception that the problem has gotten worse and that needs to be addressed. Okay. There is no one on staff who goes around and, keep, and does traffic counts routinely and looks at the neighborhood streets routinely to see how things are changing. That is not done. Can I can I just take a moment and say, the hearing is about Lincoln Avenue. What I'm gathering from this conversation of, and questions from the council is a set of much larger issues that pertain to parking in and around both the university, Amherst College, and the high school, and where it is safe and not safe. And perhaps that leads to a much larger question. However, that is not the question tonight before the council. Okay. Lynn, that feels like a, an artificial limit because we have to reference other streets to do some comparisons. Uh, we're talking... Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't reference other streets, but what we can't do is make this hearing a hearing about parking 
in all kinds of places. We can reference other streets, we can ask about it, and what I think but it's doing. But we're referencing parking on other streets. Right, but so what I, it is doing is identifying a much bigger issue that we may want to have a much larger recommendation come back to the council for. That, but tonight, this hearing is about Lincoln. Yes, Andy. So following up on that, I think that the concern that I have and maybe some of my fellow counselors have is making a decision about one street in isolation of a series of policy questions, one of which is um, the nature of the parking on the street, but one that I had identified before, and I think that um, uh, Steve had talked about earlier, which is what's the relationship between the width of streets um, and the nature of safety concerns? Um, I think, for example, of um, a number of streets in, that are within the permitted parking for downtown parking area, some of which are one way and some of which are two way. <coughs> uh, Prospect Street North and South, Sealy Street as being two examples that are extremely, uh, I think that they're probably narrower streets than the one that we're talking about. And uh, it, to the extent that the question comes up about making sure that large um, public safety um, equipment, particularly fire trucks, can get through, I think that that um, can be true in all the streets. So it's not about um, trying to broaden it to all areas as much as a question of whether we make a policy a street at a time or whether the wiser thing is to ask one of our committees to develop um, a, a broader based policy that would set a s series of standards in which we could judge this street and other streets. Thank you. Shalini. So on the one hand, oh, there are serious concerns, right? I mean, as I was reading the emails, it was scary to see the turns that people need to make and uh, the danger that uh, raises for these people, as well as when they back out of the driveway. So those are two serious concerns I was hearing. And then on the other hand, I'm seeing the public parking as a free resource for the community. And so is it fair to take that away from people, from students and workers? So, and then hearing the discussion right now where we have to look at the bigger picture of how, you know, I really appreciate the residents raising this important issue because I think this is an issue in other places and we got to address it looking at the bigger point of view. But in the interim, is there something that can be done to uh, mitigate the effect, the dangers, you know, like when they're cutting into like from Elm Street, if they're going on to Lincoln, could there be more space left so people can see the cars coming, at, you know, driving and so forth? Is there some interim, instead of making the whole street not parkable? You, you could, you could back up and make maybe 100 feet across Elm Street, no parking. Sort of the same thing as we're doing on McClellan Street where we're actually widening out the sight distance triangles where you're turning. You just want to actually create a, a buffer across from Elm Street so there's more swing room. You could do that. You can, it's, um, yeah, it's not hard and fast if you want to leave some things the way they are or make some changes or. Okay. Dorothy. Um, I have a question about, and this is really for the uh, fire department, um, talking of, starting with the, what uh, Shalini was saying about uh, more space at the intersections, which is part of your plan. I noticed that the parking, which seems to have increased, and I will say this year over previous years, uh, that I notice, I live on Amity, is that on the, from Amity on Lincoln, just so that when you're trying to turn onto uh, Lincoln from Amity either direction, you can't see where you're going. It's, you're blocked with cars on both sides that are parked up to, almost up to this, the uh, edge of the street every day, at least every weekday. Um, and I know that uh, Lincoln is seen as a major road to the university, and that would be a road for the fire department. 
what do you think is necessary to do in, on Lincoln to make it um, a, a place where if you got a call to go to the university, you could get there without hitting cars? So we need about 12 feet of clear width, mirror to mirror, to travel pretty safely with a fire engine. What you do with the other part of it, you know, we leave to you. But we need 12, 13 feet of clear space and to uh, travel down the road so we can get our trucks where we need to go. So would we have that if we had parking on both sides? I don't, I don't think so. I doubt you could create. Right. We'd have to measure it, pretty sure. But right. I don't believe looking at it and certainly looking at other streets where if you had parking on both sides that we get 12 to 13 feet. But we can confirm that. Because we often do have parking on both sides and we have two-way traffic. So if we had parking on one side, which is how many, 12 feet, and you need 12 feet, and there was no parking at all on the other side, it would be safe? Let me just check the dimensions of the here. You're talking about the south side of, what we call south side of Lincoln? Yes. Towards, towards town. No, are you talking about? It's, it's north. I'm talking about Lincoln. North of Amity Street. From, Yes, north of Amity, going towards the university, okay. but right there at the edge of Amity as, as you get onto Lincoln. Well, <clears throat> we actually now have a restriction for 120 feet. You can't park on either side 120 feet from Amity Street. You mean proposed? No. no Currently, there's a 120-foot oh. buffer from Amity Street into Lincoln. That's not being observed. Uh, it's observed. There's, there's one car that actually likes to park right there at the sign, the last sign. Uh, and he, I believe, is a resident because I've actually called he or she. <clears throat> the owner of that vehicle is probably a resident because I've actually called that car to be towed in during two snowstorms myself. Um, so it's a car that stays there pretty regularly and it's there at night. Um, but yes, 120 feet in is no parking. We've proposed in this to go 200 feet, and that'll take you past, that takes you to number 135, if you look at the map. 197 is the house where it stops now, but 135, it'll take the park, no parking all the way up to 135. And that should give you plenty of room <clears throat> to uh, turn in, turn out. Okay. Additional questions from the council? Steve. Um. So no parking in eight to five is one option. There are, I know a number of other options were discussed, parking meters, alternate side of the street. But um, I just spent the weekend in Cambridge where I used to live and we stayed near MIT on a street that had unrestricted parking except for eight to 10 a.m. So really, the, clearly the point of that was to keep people from driving to work and then walking from that street but have you, has that been considered that we simply have, you simply have no parking some block of time, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., which would then keep the long-term all-day parkers, or even 12 to 1? Or... I don't think we've considered that. Um, you know, one of the things we would need to do with that is make sure it's enforced. Yeah. Our parking enforcement officers um, are mobile at some times during the day, but that's not normally their course of business. They're mostly restricted to downtown. We would need to have discussions with the town manager about increasing, increasing the... Um, Pat, how often is the resident who parks illegally ticketed? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I know I've written tickets. I, I mean, I, something that really complaining. bothers me is that um, it's a public way. And residents and people who come to Amherst to work uh, to spend money, need places to park. And what I'm, I'm feeling like is uh, this ban from eight to five makes it okay for the residents to have as many people as they want on their street, but no one else can use the street during the day because it's too dangerous. That doesn't, sit, it doesn't make any sense. So I, I'm really trying to understand why this street is Kudos to the residents who've brought it forward, but there are plenty of residents, and kudos to them as well, who are saying this isn't necessary, including people who live on the street, who talk about the fact that two cars passing each other is more effective to keep the speed limit down than the speed bumps. So. It's 
against my working class. Okay. Are there any other questions to clarify the presentation at this time from the council? Okay. So we're going to move to the opportunity for people in the audience, uh, the residents who are here, to ask questions about the presentation. Please raise your hand if you have a question, not a statement, but a question. Statements will come later. Back there, yes. Please come forward. I'm sorry, let me state the rules. You must come forward, you must state your name, where you live, and you must stay within, I'm going to All say, right. a minute for questions, All right. okay? My name is Louise Riley. I live on the corner of Gaylord and Lincoln. I am in District 4. Most of these folks are in District 3. Mrs. Pam has been wonderful about helping me on my side get some attention, but I don't know how many people here are aware that Lincoln goes all the way to Route 9. All the conversation I'm hearing today is from Amity to the university, and we have no speed bumps. I have written letters several times, starting in 19, I mean, uh, 2015, suggesting that there be parking on the west side, not on the other side, because there are many fewer driveways, there's a sidewalk, and on my side, there are no sidewalks. We have front walks that go to the street. We cannot plow our sidewalks because of cars parking in front of them. And um, people park very close to our driveways. It's almost impossible to see how to get out. And I've actually called and the parking guy didn't want to give a ticket. And I insisted that he do okay. because he, he just said, oh, okay. and I said, no, you need to give a ticket because it's more, it's, he's over the line. He's right at my driveway. Okay. Let me anyway, be, so <laughs> that's it. Uh, again, right now we're asking for questions okay, to clarify sorry. the presentation. I guess my question is, are you aware that Lincoln extends to Route 9? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Questions? Yes, Mr. the gentleman right here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to make a comment. That it, a yeah, please sit down oh, yeah, yeah, sure, and sir. use the mic and state sorry. your name and where you live. Yeah, uh, Dennis Porter. It, it, I live I'm at sorry. The bottom this is not the time for comments. It is the time for questions about the proposal. We'll have a comment period later either in favor or against. Okay, I have a question. Okay, thank um, you. I live at the and bottom. And your can, name. Can I locate myself? Yes. Yeah, I live at the bottom of Gaylord Street. Mm -hmm. to, and so my, uh, my house is there, and in order to go west, I go to, Gale, uh, to Lincoln, and it's like this, okay? You arrive like this. You cannot see to the right or to the left because there is parking there with a silly little settle, uh, you know, um, space on both sides. So in uh, plus a tree and shrubs. So in order to see if anyone is coming from the north or the south, you have to put your car right in the middle of the road, and it is furiously dangerous Thank all the time. You. So Your I question. Would, hmm? Your question. The question is, would you, um, first of all, cease to have the parking on that side? Second, would you put in speed bumps and do what they do uh, you, from uh, Amity south, uh, north to Amity to Northampton Road? That okay. would, Thank you. That's what I would like to know. Again, we're looking for clarifying questions about the proposed changes. Gentleman in the back, please. I'm going to try to ask questions. I, I, I certainly hope so. My name is Jim Barna. Um, I'm a, uh, I'm a property owner here in Amherst on uh, 34 Dana Place. Um, and I'm also an employee of the University of Amherst. Uh, I park on that street 
And uh, my question is, would the council consider the rights of people that want to use this vital resource in their del deliberations, and will they actually get information about who parks there, and will they perhaps refrain from discriminating against certain categories of citizens who happen to be students, who happen to be employees, who happen to be working people, who happen not to own property on the street in question. This town has parking issues, and the only way to deal with it is to have as much parking available for as many people as possible. And I would like the, the government of this town to consider uh, whether they are doing damage to the future transportation needs of this town by considering ad hoc restrictions to parking. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? only questions about the proposed changes. Yeah. My name is Mattia Kramer. I'm, I live on East Pleasant, so not in this neighborhood. My question is about the proposal. There's a hot spot between Elm and McClellan. Um, is there a consideration to just ban parking in that hot spot as opposed to the entire area? Thank you for your question. Yes. Please come forward, ma'am. My name is Anik Porter. Please I'm, move move to the mic, please. Uh, my, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, as somebody said, of course, you've been talking about the north end of Lincoln Avenue with the wonderful speed bumps. I am talking about uh, like my husband, who's, uh, we live on Gaylord Street. Now, I have a question if, if and hopefully, you will uh, move the parking to the to west side because it's extremely dangerous to have it on, on the east side. Will you maybe ha consider speed bumps? Because I can assure you that on Gaylord Street and on the south side of Lincoln Avenue, people do not drive at 30 miles an hour. In fact, sometimes they, they, they drive at 40 miles an hour. And my other question is, which I think pertains to the, to the security of going uphill on Lincoln Avenue when it says it's 30, but people to rush to the top. Why not consider a traffic light at link between Lincoln and Amity. That to me would solve a lot of problems and I, because people have to stop. Of course, it may create blocks and so forth. But, but I think it, would, you, if you, would you be interested in thinking about it at least? Thank you for your question. Are there other questions? Please come forward. Julian Hines, um, District 4, 54 High Street. My question is, we see that it's within 120 feet of an intersection on Amity and within 30 feet of an intersection on Gaylord Street. So what I'm wondering is, what about for all our other streets in towns, it, streets in our town, which there are hundreds of, I imagine. Um, I'm wondering, what is the rule for those streets about how close you can park within an intersection? And does it vary within every intersection? Or is there a hard and fast rule, no parking within 60 feet of an intersection or whatever? Thank you for your question. Are there any other questions at this time? Questions regarding the proposal? Uh, Rick Peltier, 160 Lincoln Avenue. Does the council know how many children live on Lincoln Avenue in the area of interest? Thank you. Any other questions? All right. We are going to now move to the period where the public who is in favor of the proposal of, that has been put forward by the town with regard to Lincoln Avenue is to make comments. 
how many people would like to make comments? All right. Let me just say, once a comment has been made, could I also ask you not to be redundant in the interest of everyone's time? We'll start with our initial petitioner. Please come forward. And I'll give you three minutes. But if we go further than this, I'm going to start restricting you to two minutes. Yes. If I could ask a process question. Fortunately, we don't have to do this very often. So um, thank you. When, given the variations that are possible, right? Because we've already talked about it was mentioned in our memo, and it was mentioned again tonight that well, maybe one option would be. Sorry, we're not talking about the south side yet. Maybe one option would be just to do around certain intersections. So when people are speaking for or against, can they just speak for a change of some kind? Or do they have to be speaking for the exact proposal? I'm just not sure how we're dividing okay. it between those two things, because mm -hmm. there might be people in support of some variation of the proposal. So I, I don't okay. know. The, the hearing is on the proposal as made by the town. If, in speaking to that, you have other ways you'd like to see modifications, certainly you might include those. But we are really speaking about this part of Lincoln Avenue and the proposal for this part of Lincoln Avenue. Please introduce yourself. I'm David Sloviter. I live at 194 Lincoln Avenue. Lincoln Avenue is unique in its function. It is the only street other than Pleasant Street that connects Amity with full access to the UMass campus and parking lots. As a result, the flow of traffic is constant during weekdays when UMass is in session. Many delivery vehicles choose to use Lincoln Avenue rather than deal with the traffic lights, pedestrians, and traffic on Pleasant Street. The restricted travel lanes that exist throughout the day as a result of the row of parked cars has created a situation that makes travel on Lincoln Avenue difficult and unsafe. There are delays near misses and difficulty turning onto Lincoln throughout the day. It is the combination of the volume and the loss of the full width of the street for transit that has created the problem. If the frequency of near misses on Lincoln occurred in the airline industry, the FAA would shut down airports until the problem was fixed. The town manager's proposal deals only with a limited problem on one street and is not part of a town-wide solution, nor should it be seen as one. It does not in any way propose eliminating parking on any other streets. The proposal recognizes the unique aspect of the volume of traffic on Lincoln and addresses the specific problem from which town residents are seeking relief from the only authorized body that can provide that relief. This is not about a neighborhood asking for special treatment, but rather a group of Amherst residents asking town council to protect them and all the people who use the street. This issue should not be seen as a conflict between residents and UMass staff. We recognize that UMass staff are under financial pressure like many others. We have no personal conflict with their attempts to save money and, in fact, sympathize with the challenges they face. We do not, however, feel that it is the responsibility of the town of Amherst in general, nor one neighborhood in particular, to bear the burden of UMass's failure to properly accommodate their employees and ask those residents to live in an unsafe situation. We want to thank the town manager and staff for being receptive to our problem and responding to fix it. The current situation benefits a few, but it is a burden to many. It needs to end. Thank you Thank for you. your, excuse me, we don't, I must ask you not to demonstrate one way or another in favor or against. Thank you. Who else would like to speak in favor of the proposal? Please come forward. Nancy Gilbert, 166 Lincoln Avenue. I've lived on the road for 35 years. And one thing that I don't know if all of you get is we're the major thoroughfare from Route 9 to the university, which makes our road a little different. 
there are several safety issues. One that happened today. Today, I was raking the front of my yard. I was standing about two feet in and going like that with my rake. A car, because there were cars parked across the street, came right on the curb, and my rake almost went into that uh, car, and he beeped his horn. That's, and he was coming pretty fast. I stand there, I have my grandchildren three times a week, I have a four-year-old, I hold his hand. If he were to ever just look like that, he might get her hit by a car because they, they literally kiss the curb when their car is on the other side. Twice in December when there was snow, I pulled out, I basically stopped. Another car was coming down quite slowly and both of our side rear mirrors clicked. Um, we also have trouble if there's oil delivery. And if there's oil delivery parked and they're pumping out oil and there's parking across the street, a fire truck, a police car, or an ambulance could never get down the street. And we've had many accidents in the past at different spots on the street and they were sort of taken care of. There was four-way stop and on fearing. I just hope that there aren't serious accidents, especially of children getting hurt or injured or killed on our street because it's not safe to cross or even be within four feet of your um, curb on your front yard on the west side. Thank you for your comment. Additional comments supporting the proposal. Please come forward. I'm sorry, I can't really tell if this is in support or in opposition, but, <laughs> um, but what I will say is that I believe that it isn't an only a Lincoln Ave problem. I guess I'm in support of fixing this issue on Lincoln Ave, but I am in support of doing it as we fix the same issue that is occurring on many other streets in town. And I share the woman's concerns who just spoke, but I share these concerns about most of the streets surrounding Lincoln Avenue. I share these concerns of many streets in town, especially downtown Amherst, and I don't want it to be where if a group of residents who is active and outspoken enough to come to the council and petition a change like this, or where someone gets injured or killed because of these issues, I don't want it to be that that is what causes change on that one street. What I want it to be is a town-wide issue where everyone comes together, looks at the issue as a town, and looks at how many streets need to be addressed. Um, and then we look into that issue, put it as a charge on a committee, and go through a route that might be a little bit longer, but ensures safety for everyone equally as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there other comments in support of the proposal? Please, the gentleman way back, yes. My name is uh, Frank Myers, and I've lived on Lincoln for 40 years. And I'm going to be very specific about my concern. My concern is, is about the safety of getting uh, ambulances and fire trucks. But the, the ambulances are the big things. It's not so much that the, uh, the parked cars are the major issue. The major issue is the volume and two other cars. So you have basically three cars very close, and most times not. So one car stops, another one goes, stops, goes, and, and it, it goes on all day long. My biggest concern, uh, having been a retired physician, this neighborhood has become very elderly. Okay, and I suspect the 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 no sorry, <laughs> but uh, the major problem though is ambulances coming mm -hmm. uh, and getting there in a timely fashion. Uh, most of the things that I have seen, because of taking care of a lot of these people, are are strokes, heart attacks, all of which are extremely time sensitive. This is not a question of just the parking. It's, it's getting an ambulance when cars are stopped all the way down the line. If you have an oil truck, the, the street is closed, okay? An ambulance trying to come here, and we're talking five minutes, 10 minutes, 
is very important for treating certain illnesses, okay? And I've had the experience myself in my own house, okay? My wife fell down the stairs, had a severe uh, head injury, uh, couldn't breathe, was unconscious. The ambulance came in about five minutes, which was fantastic, saved her life. Looking at the street right now, at certain times of the day, that is going to be, it will be delayed by 10, 15 minutes at certain times. And that is my biggest concern, okay? And it's not that it's all day long, okay? But when it happens, it's going to take lives. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yes, all the way in the back, please come forward. Yes, you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. Okay, Louise Riley again. <laughs> I'm, um, Please sit down to second. make your comments. All right. I am certainly supporting any attention that my neighbors get on the other side of Amity Street. I would like to know why I, I understood that this was a hearing about Lincoln Avenue, <coughs> all of Lincoln, and then suddenly I'm hearing that section of Lincoln Avenue. So I'm a little bit frustrated, put it mildly, especially since I've written letters without any acknowledgement for years about this issue. So I, I just don't know what to do to get attention for my end of Lincoln Avenue, for the people who speed down, we do not have speed bumps, they are coming to go right onto Amity to avoid the light at the, in town, they're coming to go to the theater or whatever they're gonna go up, up Amity Street or left down Amity Street or straight. So we got even more traffic on my end of Lincoln. So I, I don't know what to do to get some attention for uh, my end. And I'm only saying park, I'm not saying no parking. I'm thinking just parking on the west side, please. Okay. Thank you. Additional comments with regard to this proposal. This is in support of the proposal. Over here, sir. We'll come back, don't worry. Thank you, I'm Bruce Wilcox. I live at 191 Lincoln. I've lived there for 37 years. Um, I support the town manager's proposal. I think he did a really good job of talking with the different departments uh, about the issue that some neighbors had raised. I did not sign the petition, I was out of town, but I support the petition because of the concerns that my neighbors here have raised. So I'd just like to say three, make three points. One is, and this has been made I suppose, it's really only on weekdays when UMass is in session. And particularly in the spring and the fall, the rest of the time there is no problem. So I take it that it's people heading to the university. I worked at the university for 32 years. I bicycled to work most days, but I got a perking permit because in the winter and on bad days, you know, I, could, I couldn't bicycle, I realized how expensive those permits are. I sympathize with the students and the graduate students and the staff, faculty who would prefer not to pay those high rates on campus and here's a street that's open. So I understand why uh, people are parking there. I, I might well in the same situation, but it does seem to me it's created a, a problem in terms of danger. Point one, point, point two, is that um, it's really just a recent problem. As I said, 37 years, it's only in the last 18 months that this has happened. My own theory is that by putting in signs that say no parking here to corner, people took a look at those signs and realized, oh, well, I guess we can park the rest of the street. And so pretty soon <laughs> it filled up. And that, that led to the current circumstance. And my third point, and this was uh, raised by one of the counselors, uh, has to do with whether there will be spillover and to what extent there will be spillover into other streets. Well, if you look at the map, other than Sunset, and there is one section of Sunset that might be in jeopardy, but there's restricted parking or no parking on the rest of Lincoln, on McClellan, on Cosby, on Fearing. So this is just one last stretch uh, that parking is permitted on. And um, as the neighbors were saying, there's been a lot of concern about the safety issues. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yes, please come forward. Okay. You, we need you to sit down again and state your name. Thank you. Okay. 
as I said earlier, we live at the end of at the west side of uh, west end of Gerald Street. This means that um, when I drive, I'm the main driver. In the house, okay, <coughs> when I drive, either turn left or right on Lincoln Avenue, I have to contend with sometimes very large SUVs, trucks, or people who actually work for my neighbors, our neighbors, and so forth, and have to park somewhere. And there is absolutely no way except to crawl into the middle of the street of Lincoln Avenue in order to make sure that left and right are safe. I've, been, I've come close to close collisions. And it's very, very difficult because Gaylord Street is a very narrow street. We love the fact that we have a sidewalk, but unfortunately, the parking on the opposite side of our house, which is the south side, is very generous in terms, it doesn't take into account the the setback from the street from Lincoln Avenue, nor does it take into account that those of us who, li who live on the north side, yes, on the north side of the street, I have driveways. And sometimes to get out of our driveway, we have to back out, which is, very, which is not our preference. We would prefer to be able to back in because it's safer both at, at any time, any, any circumstance, any time of the day, and the, and the temperature on the, on the, but the parking is, and it's legal, it's legal, but maybe I think it's two feet from the, the sidewalk across the street. Well, so when I come out of my driveway, I have, I'm looking at a, at a car. And if I, sometimes it's easier for me to, to drive on the, on the sidewalk. Well, that is not how it should be. And I know because ambulances have come and all big trucks, fire trucks, and they, they actually drive on the sidewalk. So I would like to have some kind of relief from both Lincoln Avenue and from the first the uh, driveway on the on the south side, and I'm sure the, uh, my neighbors would feel the same way, although they are in a different, very different situations than we have. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for your comment. This is statements in favor of the proposal that the town has put forward. Yes, sir, please come forward. David Ratner, 199 Lincoln. I've lived there for many years. Uh, I wrote to you folks all, but I want to repeat it ever so briefly. Uh, I was the one who witnessed a fire truck stuck at the corner of Amity trying to turn down Lincoln heading north. I was the first car opposing it while I was try trying to drive south. The fire engine managed to pull into the, the first uh, no parking zone, but then was absolutely stuck there. I tried to back up to get out of the fire engine's way, but that was not possible because there were at least two, maybe three cars behind me, so we were heading south. Now, it didn't have its sirens on because it was the Merry Maple lighting, so this was not a dangerous situation, but had it occurred on another time for another reason, namely a fire, I think it would have been quite difficult. It was impossible to back up, and it was also impossible for the fire truck to, uh, to go past. Uh, other points, I would simply say it is so different. The, the parking situation is so different this year from preceding years. Something has changed dramatically. And uh, finally, with respect to Sunset Avenue versus Lincoln, although I live in Lincoln, not Sunset, my wife and I walk on Sunset regularly, the traffic on Sunset does not approach the traffic on Lincoln. And were there to be increased traffic on parking on Sunset, that would be unfortunate, but it would not present the same uh, hazardous situation that heavy traffic and parking does on Lincoln. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. Dale Peterson, 234 Lincoln Avenue. Good evening, counselors. 
Clearly, this hearing is the beginning of a very large and urgent issue before the town. My wife and I happen to live in the Hawk Center. If there were a West McClellan Street, it would be our driveway. <laughs> and I want to speak to the clear and present danger that exists from Route 9 all the way down to Fearing uh, on Lincoln Avenue. The problem is that at present, we, the town is extremely fortunate that there has not been a fatality or certainly physical injury because there are instances where it's necessary for large vehicles to be parked on the west side of Lincoln. Oil trucks have been mentioned, tree work is done, the town itself brings in its equipment. They can't park where the cars are on the other side of the street. And the spectacle, my wife and I watch it every work day, the spectacle is that you have bicyclists going both ways on Lincoln Avenue. You have pretty much a parking lot, certainly from Amity up to uh, McClellan. You have runners, high school runners, college, university runners going by, pedestrians occasionally trying to cross the street, although they would be wisely advised not to even attempt it. So my, my plea to you is that there be fairly alertly and promptly a recognition of the clear and present safety dangers, hazards, on the stretch of Lincoln. Uh, and actually, I would quite agree with my neighbors that it, the problem exists all the way from Route 9 down to at least McClellan. There's a clear and present danger here, and I would hope that the council can find a way to elect, uh, act alertly and promptly uh, and not delay much further. Regard this proposal as the initiation of further action but not an invitation for you to delay it, please. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Are there any other comments speaking in favor of the proposal? Please come forward. Uh, Rick Peltier, 160 Lincoln Avenue. Uh, I am halfway to 90 years old. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have called uh, and emailed the parking office on a number of occasions, on the order of six or seven times, uh, with complaints about obstructing of fire hydrants. Uh, parkers just park in front of fire hydrants or too close to them to obstruct them. Uh, very often it's not ticketed because they are under-resourced and they don't have the capacity to come listen to a, a single complaint. That's a clear and present danger to public safety. Uh, and it is our charge as citizens to make sure that our town is safe for all. Uh, it is a pr uh, problem that persists. It happens um, all of the time, but it's almost always during the work week. Uh, and I would echo what everybody said, that this is a problem from eight to five. But because the parking office is a fairly under-resourced office, I encourage you not to look at alternatives like parking meters uh, where you, it requires enforcement. They do not have the ability to enforce that kind of obligation. Every morning I wake up and get my kids ready for school. Uh, the number 17 bus comes around 8.15. Uh, we cannot stand by the road uh, because at 8.15 in the morning, that is the Lincoln Avenue slalom where cars are zipping in and out, avoiding parked cars as they're late to work or late to class. We have to stay back from behind the, the, uh, the roadway because it is unsafe. My children are between six and 11 years old. Uh, and to answer my rhetorical question from earlier, there are 10 children that live on Lincoln from Amity to campus. That's roughly mm -hmm. one child per accident that happens on Lincoln every year. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments in, in support of the proposal? All right. Now we're going to move to that part of the hearing where we ask for comments in opposition to the proposal. Please come forward. <laughs> Uh, Mattia Kramer, East Pleasant Street. Um, I think that the question has to do with what kind of town we want to be. Uh, do we want to be a kind of town that 
um, allocates resources based on uh, private property ownership and an organized few, or based on a larger group, less well organized certainly, and probably not so well off. Um, I, I hear impassioned arguments about safety, and Lincoln is also, it's a lovely neighborhood, and how lovely that that neighborhood can be so close to town. It's a, it's a wonderful location. In terms of the safety concern, though, we heard, uh, we saw data tonight, 5,700 vehicular observations and only 10 enforceable violations. I thought that was a vanishingly small rate of uh, violations, and we also saw over a period of three years data that said there were zero accidents um, but, uh, for pedestrians and cyclists. So I thought the, the safety argument, I, and again, understand I'm sympathetic to folks in the neighborhood, and ultimately an is, it's an issue of what sort of town we wanna be. Thank you for your comment. Are there other people who would like to speak in opposition? Please come forward. Hello again, Jim Barner, 34, uh, Dana Place. Um, I've heard a lot of, uh, you know, very interesting uh, and insightful um, concerns by the people on Lincoln Street. And I, th I wanna point out some ways that some of these things could be mitigated without losing parking on that street. Um, as far as I know, it is well within the ambit of this town to uh, no longer allow commercial vehicles on that street. That would, uh, and, and you know, we've got a police force. You, you make it uh, no commercial vehicles, and then the first time uh, a truck driving up to UMass goes through there, you ticket them. We can resolve that. It's not a, it's not a difficult issue in terms of, uh, in terms of the street. Um, with regard to um, uh, the traffic swerving, uh, this is a street I walk twice a day every day. I walk it between 8 and 10 a.m. and between 4 and 6 p.m. twice a day. I invite you to walk this street. Um, and, you know, certainly if my wife lived on Lincoln Avenue, she'd be, uh, you know, banging her hand on, uh, on the uh, the desk claiming that it's the most dangerous street in the world. But if you were to walk this street, it's a pretty normal street. It already has uh, uh, traffic slowed down. Um, certainly there are problems. There is definitely a problem on the corner of Lincoln Avenue and Amity Street. And you're not gonna solve that problem by restricting parking there. The problem is people come out of the town center on Amity Street going west, and they suddenly think they're out of town, and they speed up like banshees. Um, there needs to be a four-way stop there, or a traffic light there, or a cop, cop park there, which I did see the other day, uh, and, and that was beneficial. Um, so you got the problem there. Um, the curb cups on Amity Street are not uniform all the way across. So a lot of drivers will swerve to the right so that it doesn't bump them as much. And that's some of that swerving activity we get uh, on that street. Um, certainly that's something that the town can look at and, and you know that little bit of wildness would be uh, resolved that way. Um, people make rational decisions in their own self-interest about where to park and how to drive. And you're chasing people's rational decision-making process. Now you can either make policies that take the whole group into account or you're gonna keep chasing them. You put this parking restriction on Lincoln, I'm gonna be the first one parking on Sunset. And when you put that restriction on Sunset, I'm gonna be the first person if there's parking on Amity Street, on Lincoln Street south of Amity still, I'll park there. I walk a half mile 
uh, from uh, Lincoln Street to my office. I only park on Lincoln Street when it rains. Generally, if I'm walking from my house, it's 1.2 miles. Uh, the fact of the matter is everyone who parks there has a rational reason for parking there, and you have done nothing to find out what those reasons are. This town spends a lot of time abstractly considering uh, rules regarding parking and what people who park need or want, but but in, you know, unless you're taking money out of their pockets, you don't care about their parking. You're gonna remove 100 parking spots from the town. This is 100 all-day parking spots that are free. That's valuable property. And I don't think it's in the best interest of the town to do that. I need you to wrap up. Okay, well, I've said everything I need to say, but thank you very much. Thank you. This is comments in opposition. Please come forward. Fletcher Clark, East Pleasant Please Street. sit down and oh, start. Yep. Got it. We're on air, and we like to make sure that the I get to sit on this side TV. with you every other Wednesday. Ah, there you go. So Fletcher Clark, East Pleasant Street, um, as someone who's on two town committees who has to get here before the 8 o'clock meter ends, um, I voice opposition to this, um, to this proposal. Thank you for your comment. Please come forward. Yes. Hi, I'm Suki Krauss. I live at 163 Lincoln Avenue. Um, parking is a very, very precious resource. And um, I, I don't feel like I have the right as just because there's parking in front of my house or there's parking on our street to make decisions that affect both civic and neighborly um, have civic and neighborly effects. I, it's been a busy street. It's been a busy street. We've, my ha that house has been in our family since 1962. And we were there before there was University Avenue. And um, it's, it is, it's a busy street, and I'm not going to say there aren't problems. However, I don't feel that displacing our problems onto our neighbors is going to make the answer. I think the problem is that we need a bigger um, solution to parking in Amherst. And um, you know, we see the map here that shows sunset, but it could be just as easily displaced to the east side of town. Because I think most of the people that are in front of my house are working downtown. They're not, they're not going down to the university. So I, but I don't want to make that guess. I just, I just don't feel that this is the right thing to do for our neighbors. Thank you for your comment. Are there other comments in opposition to the proposal that the town has made. Okay, then we will move back to further questions from the council. Alyssa. So aside from the fact that we have so many different theories as to how many parking spaces this is, um, which I'm not really sure how to manage, um, but I'd love to have something a little clearer on that. I realize it's difficult when we don't when we don't mark them, and we also have different lengths of parking spaces throughout town. So it's all a made up thing, as we saw from previous parking studies. One of the, so I, I can't put it in context effectively with, for people. A more specific question I have, in terms of the driveways and the fire hydrants. So because we don't mark spaces, right, we therefore don't have the little markings that say don't park here because there's a fire hydrant, and we don't have markings for people's driveways, which they have in some communities and we don't have here. Even if we say this is only eight to five, as some neighbors have indicated as a compromise position on their part to not say never, just eight to five weekdays. So at night and weekends, people are still, I realize the volume changes, but people are still going to be parking at the edges of their driveways and still going to be parking in front of fire hydrants. So do we have technical things that we can adopt from other towns that we haven't done here for various reasons? But because this is a high visibility street, we would consider doing because that feels to me like that's going to remain a problem whether we have parking there or sometimes and even if we don't have it there from 8 to 5, it's still going to be a problem. If we get all the economic development downtown that we want, that's going to be a great place to park on Saturdays. And people are saying they don't have a problem with people parking there on Saturdays because for a lot of reasons that I won't elaborate on. And 
at that time, people are going to park in front of the fire hydrants, and they're going to park in people's park at the edges of people's driveway. So, I'm not seeing this as a big solution. I understand that it feels like it's something for people, but it feels like we ought to be able to do something with all our amazing engineering skills and enforcement skills to make this easier for people who are parking in this random area to know how close am I supposed to be to a driveway? How far away am I supposed to be from a fire hydrant? Most people don't remember what was in their driver book when they were 16. Uh, do, would the two of you like to come forward again in case there's questions? That doesn't mean we don't have fire questions too, okay? Thank you. Response to the question asked? So I don't know if I actually heard the question from a law enforcement perspective, but um, most of, for enforcement efforts with our parking enforcement people, anything that's not downtown where their uh, districts are broken up, where they're actually uh, very specific, specific times patrolling, most of the other outside of the center of town uh, ticketing is done by complaint. So if somebody calls up and says somebody's parked in front of a fire hydrant on McClellan Street, we'll dispatch either an officer or a parking enforcement person there to handle those. But yes, the hydrant areas are not marked. They're certainly not marked clearly, and um, that poses a problem sometimes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve. Yeah, so I, I have a number of comments. So one is there's some of the letter writers have mentioned this, some of the speakers have mentioned this, but there's this concept conflict are the safety comments to my in my opinion are in conflict with each other so on one hand there's a desire to make Lincoln less desirable so I heard a lot of comments that there's a huge volume of traffic going down Lincoln so if I hear that my instinct is then let's make the make then make it as hard as possible to go down Lincoln and the answer to that is park on the street so so the proposal before us so normally when you see no parking on a street, 8 to 5 or in that window there, the reason is because you want to make that a major commuter artery. So if that's a desire, we should remove the speed bumps and make that a major commuter artery. In other words, so it makes no sense to have a street with speed bumps on it where you're trying to restrict traffic and then take the parking off of that because actually that makes it more desirable. So I, I'm on Lincoln all the time. I've ridden my bike dozens of miles on it. But I just ride my bike on Lincoln because I work in UMass. And I have to come to town all the time. And Lincoln is the safe way to ride my bike because my other options, um, North Pleasant and I don't even remember, are very, you know, much less safe. So Lincoln's actually the safe road for me to ride my bike. And if I feel unsafe riding on the street, which I never do, I can ride on the sidewalk. So you can, in Amherst, you can actually ride your bike on the sidewalk, I believe, outside of the downtown area. That's right. Yeah. So the third thing is the park streets actually make it much safer, I'm sorry, the park cars actually make it much safer for the sidewalk. So the sidewalk is on the east side. There's nothing safer than a bunch of park cars. I mean, we've heard about embankment runs and things like that, but there's nothing safer than park cars to protect pest, you know, the pedestrians that we've heard about. And I think it's very telling that there have been zero pedestrian accidents and zero bicycle accidents. So another comment, and somebody mentioned this earlier, is that I actually think that the speed bumps are causing, <laughs> if there's any problem for bikes, I think it's the speed bumps that are causing those problems because as we've heard, um, a lot of cars try to veer around at the speed bumps. So they come, it's like a solemn course. So they, so they go very close to the curb, much closer than they should. So, so, so these are the, the concerns I'm, I think that there is a, always has been an issue as long as I've lived here, of Lincoln being the desire line between basically the downtown area and parts of the university. That's always existed. The university is growing. It's becoming more desirable. Um, I, I can see what the problems are with the continuing row of parking. Oh, one, one other comment is public safety. On Lincoln, the, the, the first responders are going to be going lights on, sirens blasting, I assume, and cars will find a way to get out of the way, even if they have to go. There's many narrower streets with parking on it, even on this map. The Prospect Street, 
much the street so I don't I think that public safety is overthought are there any other questions or comments from the council yes Evan right so uh, I guess I had two questions so when we authorized this hearing a while back one of the things I said that I would be interested in seeing was uh, alternatives that were considered um, to this proposal. The only one that I saw in the report was the potential for parking meters. And so I'm wondering if there were alternative ways to consider um, perhaps solving what many perceive to be as a problem without this. Um, and and as, as, as open as possible. So, I mean, in theory, you have two parallel streets that lead between Amity and Mass Ave. Could you, like we did on North and South Prospect, make them each one way going opposite directions? That would eliminate two-way traffic and maintain that because that was brought up was North Prospect in the presentation was that's not wide enough to have two lanes of traffic plus a lane of parked cars so we make it one way well it seems like we have a similar situation here so that's question one is was there alternatives including the option of making Lincoln and Sunset opposite direction one-way streets um, and then the second thought that Steve sort of touched on um, is I was actually the most surprising thing of everything that I've seen tonight was that the average speed on Lincoln is is 19 miles an hour when the speed limit is 30. I can't imagine a, a, a street where the speed limit average is over 10 miles per hour lower than the the actual posted speed limit. And as someone, well, I won't get into my own driving habits. Um, so, and, and to me, that's a direct result of having these parked cars there. And so I'm curious um, your thoughts on that speed, that, that, that average speed, and whether or not there's an expectation that that could rise um, if that this parking is removed. If that parking is removed, do you want to go or do you want me to? You can start, and I'll come in. Um, I think there were a number of discussions Guilford and I had, and then with the town manager as well. I mean, if we had a carte blanche, Mastercard Gold, we could probably fix all of the problems, quite honestly. And then a lot of it involved one-way streets, and it probably wouldn't be really. It wouldn't make the residents real happy with the proposals that we had. That being said, and going further with some of your comments, um, I did not believe there was a speeding problem on Lincoln Avenue, so I'm not surprised by the data. Um, if we go with the proposal, I'm suspecting we will have a speeding problem on Lincoln Avenue. Um, it's my own thoughts. So w I said that every once in a while we talk about Lincoln Avenue. So. Um, First thing is, uh, when I first got here, the first proposed roundabout in the town of Amherst was the intersection of Lincoln and Amity Street. It was proposed by the town engineer in about 2001, 2002, because there were complaints about the intersection not functioning properly and people were shooting across, much faster shooting across from Lincoln South to Lincoln North across Amity Street, and there had been a few more accidents and so forth. That's just one thought. And as that transformed as I was here, we did a great deal of analysis, and this was what accumulated from this was the actual installation of the speed bumps, speed humps. Um, but what we proposed in that, in many of those discussions, was actually one weighing, one weighing Lincoln, one weighing Sunset. We also talked about just cutting off the cutting off the neighborhood. We talked about making it so that you could not go from Lincoln across Fearing into campus, and we talked about making a Sunset so you could not cross fearing in the sunset. So basically made this neighborhood into its own little cul-de-sac and, and that would, one, take care, of the, take care of the speeding. And actually if you look at other neighborhoods in town, you'll find that was done. In the old town, far, far, far view, far view. Um, it's called, we call it Struttersville, it used to be the Strutters Farm. Struttersville area town, this north side of campus, that section of town was cut off from the campus. Those roads actually connected to campus, and then they were cut off. And walking paths exist now so you can walk between the neighborhoods and campus. Um, so we had taken that same approach for the Lincoln, Lincoln Avenue neighborhood. Um, it was vehemently opposed. No one wanted to do that. No one wanted to cut off the neighborhood. No one wanted to, well, actually, some people did, but the majority of people didn't. Don't cut off the neighborhood. 
don't make it one way. So we've looked at it multiple times, and we really haven't gone back to it because we don't think there's an appetite in the community to make it one way. Although it would be, um, you would be able to deal with the issues. You can make it one way, you could have parking on one side, and if you wanted to, you could actually even raise up part of the roadway and have a travel lane for bicyclists that's separate from traveling in the roadway. Um, so there's lots of options you could. <laughs> there, there is a lot of little things you could do, but we were asked to look at a parking situation, so we didn't venture much beyond it because we all have bruises from the last time we ventured beyond it, um, so we didn't do it because we weren't asked. Okay. Pat. Um, I'm listening to your cul-de-sac idea. Um, in creating a little enclave. And what's gonna to happen to all the people who need to park and walk to the university, walk to the bookstore because they walk, work there? What's gonna to happen to the people who are using Lincoln Avenue if you make it this cul-de-sac? And I know you're saying, oh, there could be cute little paths, but it doesn't you, help if, in the snow. If you, made a cul if you made it into a cul-de-sac, you would have the ability to keep parking on the street because you wouldn't have the volume of traffic driving up and down the street. But you have traffic traveling at about 19 miles an hour, and there's no speeding problem on this street the way it is now with track parking on the east side. So You have a volume problem is really what it boils down to. The volume problem is in, your, is in the imagination. In a, not you, I know you can count the cars, I know you can count the cars, but we have volume all over town. And, and I feel like because there are a lot of cars using the street, doesn't mean that it's unsafe. And, and you, what you say is completely true. We were asked to look at Lincoln Avenue. We weren't asked to look at every street in town. There's places where I can tell you there should definitely be no parking on the street and they should be one way. Um, but you're opening up a bigger discussion than just Lincoln Avenue. Dorothy. Um, now, I'm, now I'm forgetting what I was going to say, but it's about if you did, if you did the enclave, um, you would be pleasing one group of parkers on, on Lincoln Avenue. I read every single letter on both sides. And the letter writing campaign that happened very recently of people against the parking change were basically from graduate students who parked there and then walk or bike to the university. And they expressed that this allowed them, and many of them come from out of town, okay? They come there and they park, and then they're able to have this 20 to 30 minute, whichever way you go, daily experience of fresh air, and the whole thing was part of a more healthy lifestyle. Which led me to think, why doesn't the university make some really cheaper parking lots further away from the school for people to park and then walk a ride. Because many of them, and we have pictures that were taken by people on Lincoln Avenue of people parking and then taking their bike out of the trunk and getting on the bike and biking to the campus. So, you know, that is, the people would still be able to park as you say, there would be a walking path, they would get their exercise, and we would not displace many parkers. And it would not be cut off from the downtown, it would be not cut off from Amherst Cinema for evening parking, and that actually might solve some of the problems. Are there other comments from councilors? Yes, Pat. I guess it just, for some people, boils down to um, only residents should be accommodated, not all the people who come to town to use it for education, for theater, for, for walking in parks. And I find that troubling. Okay, Mandy Joe. So I'm struggling with this because parking is a public resource and I, in talking to the residents that believe this is a safety hazard, they said it was because of volume and because there was a lot of commercial traffic. Yet your traffic study showed that only 3% of the vehicles that go down that street are commercial. And when I've walked the street, when I've stared at the street, cars can pass albeit slow and carefully, but fairly easily with a couple of feet distance. So I'm struggling with why it's a safety issue when on the south side of Lincoln it's not a safety issue, on High Street it's not a safety issue, on Sunset it wouldn't be a safety issue. Um, and I'm also struggling with it's downtown. 
it is UMass. We have a parking problem in this town. At what point do we say it's an urban area and parking on streets in urban areas is normal? Um, so I, I guess one of the questions I have is to th those fellow counselors that were here when we limited parking on from eight to five between McClellan and Fearing and on Cosby, I assume Cosby is even short, smaller width-wise than Lincoln. Um, why did we do that? And did that really just result in pushing a problem further south? And w would we even consider possibly not limiting that parking eight to five if we're not gonna do it on the other part of Lincoln? What was the purpose for that resulted in McClellan to fearing being limited eight to five and fearing to North Hadley Road being completely no parking on the east side of the street. Can we get a history as to why those are even treated differently than the other parts of Lincoln? I don't remember. So they go back beyond me. Hmm. So, so it's over 20, 20 years old. The changes that were made on McClellan, Page, Best, and Cosby, Nutting, Phillips, and Allen Street all came out of the work for the resident parking permits. Um, these neighborhoods were parked up pretty substantially and people were complaining and they said we need parking for, you know, parking for the residents. We don't have any. Um, <clears throat> so that brought about and you can read it in the bylaws, brought about the permit parking for either downtown or for resident-only neighborhoods. And that's kind of where that came from. And that was before me. Um, and that's where it happened. Uh, McClure, uh, Sunset, at all, that little section at the very, let me see if I can get this to work this time. This little section in here um, was very transient and that's how a lot of no parking happened in that area. It was a lot of um, rental properties, and there was a couple of, um, what do you call those fraternities? They aren't really fraternities. Fake fraternities. Oh, cool. Uh, there, <laughs> there was a lot of fake fraternities in the area, and the parking was very, it, was, it got to be really, really out of control at almost many times in the day, because they were parking on both sides, and you couldn't get down the road. So we actually, that was actually made no parking both sides. And that was also before my time. Uh, the parking is not, there's no parking on the west side of Sunset by the campus because the campus controls that sidewalk and they wanted it no parking and we had already, the town had already made it no parking on the east side. So that's how that got to be that way. So there's a whole bunch of stories and they go back pretty far. This is kind of the last area that has still got some parking left. Kathy, you had a question? No, I was going to, um, I was going to build a little bit on Dorothy's comment, but it says a question. Uh, New York, UMass does have outlying lots um, for parkers, but when I look, the cheapest is $270. So have we approached UMass to say, make the outlying lots cheap so that the commuters and people who need to put their cars can put them there, because they're often empty. And we've been here 30, 35 years ago, and that they used to be very cheap, because they're outlying lots. So they're not being used, but they're empty. And I'm not sure how much the university would lose by making a $50 lot. And so I'm just, you know, so if the, some of the pressure is an overflow, and it's more recent. And I know we were told by the university it hasn't gone up very much. But fees have gone up, and tuition has gone up. So then, when you add two hundred and seventy dollars, if you can save that two seventy, it, so it's it's looking at removing the pressure that isn't a worker downtown or a visitor downtown. That's purely that someone's trying to come to school and needs to get there and put their car somewhere, and especially the commuter kids that can't afford to live in the dorms. Okay. Um, I have a comment. So when we first started looking at Lincoln in the early 2000s, we did approach the university about the fact they have these high fees. Uh, the fees were actually less than they are now at, the, at that time. Uh, they were still, uh, it was still around $100 for the outlying lots. Um, and if you actually buy a permit in the outlying lots, it's not a permit for a space. 
it's really, it's really a hunting permit. And if you look at most colleges, that's what they sell, a hunting permit. You have a permit to hunt for a space on campus and you get to have the closest one that you can find if you're lucky. Um, so that's kind of how the permit systems are on most campuses. And they are, the, the fees that UMass is charging is about comparable to the other universities of their size. I paid, well, this was even farther back. This was over 30 years ago. The permit fee I paid to go to North Carolina State was a $200 fee, and I walked a mile and a half from the lot to my school, to my building. So it's, the prices are not that out of line. Are there additional comments or questions from the council? Dorothy. Well, I have two problems. Um, one is that the data that you gave us is not up to date, because uh, people are think, saying, oh, it's really not that dangerous. But it was just a few weeks ago that in one day, within a few hours of each other, there were two accidents at the corner of Amity and Lincoln that involved blazing cars, uh, and people were sending me photos, uh, and we went out and took a look. Um, things, and most of the people from Lincoln who have testified have said, this is something that has really gotten much worse recently. Then we've had general conversation here amongst counselors about the need for a whole parking program or plan, which I agree with. However, no one has mentioned that as part of our, our master plan, we have a downtown zone where people can build big buildings and include no parking for their tenants. The theory being, you don't need a car, you can use the bus, and I think most of us know that it really you do need cars. So the reason there aren't enough parking places is that there is a policy which is outlined weekly or bi-weekly at planning board meetings which said people don't need cars, people aren't using cars, they're using Uber, they can use the bus. So there is a big need for a big rethinking of parking in town. But I am strongly advocating that we do accept the proposal which has been put together by the people from the town you see sitting here, people who've studied it, who work in it, who know what's going on, and understand that yes, we have to do what has been mentioned here, a rational town-wide parking policy, including increasing, you know, as many people have said, increasing the supply through a parking garage, which is discussed. But please pass this now for Lincoln, and we can see what happens, because in the recent years, last two years or 18 months, it has become very dangerous. And we can then come together and talk and say, did that work? Did the things that were forecast fall apart? Or, you know, shall we redo it? But I don't want the idea that this is going to be folded into this big, huge, town-wide parking plan that we're going to do, which might not be ready for a couple of years, although it, it's really necessary for it to be done. So I really, I urge you to think, these people have put in a lot of time and effort in putting together a plan based on what they know about the town. Let's support it and then walk forward for a town-wide parking policy. At this point, uh, are there any more questions from the council? Because otherwise we will move to close the hearing. Okay. Is Yes, Steve. I was wondering if the chief would mind repeating something that I think you said earlier, which is that if we take away the parking on Lincoln as proposed, then it's in your experience that then we'll have a speeding problem. A problem I'm not sure of, but I believe the speeds will increase there on a regular basis. I mean, it's just one of the things, and I think one of the counselors brought it up, um, having the two-way traffic with the parking almost mandates that you go slow. Are there other questions from the council at this time? Um, just Guilford? Before, before you leave that, the actual traffic counter that when it was installed for this traffic count, let me see if I can. So the location of the traffic counter was between McClellan and Cosby. It's in a section of the road that now has no parking eight to five. So there are speed, um, speed bumps along the road, but it's already, that, that section where the counter is has no parking on that section. Okay. Sarah? 
I'm not sure if this has been answered completely, so if it has, just be like, Sarah, go back and look somewhere. But it, as far as like safety goes, so I'm wondering, you know, we heard from people that they are concerned, you know, because they're getting older, so am I, like, and, and about safety vehicles being able to actually get into a residence in a, a certain amount of time. And also I'm thinking from somebody who drives a fire truck, like I'm just wondering, is what kind, what is really the the danger if there is to having cars parked at the um, fire hydrants and is it is it an economical solution that maybe we could do even some painting you know just around the hydrants delineating like hey don't park right here there's a fire hydrant well obviously the vehicles we drive are, are large I mean, they are long they are wide and we need a certain amount of distance and whether you figure out a way to do it with decreased parking on one side or limited parking we use that opportunity to drive more safely um, if you squeeze that space in, I'm more likely to have accidents, repairs, and downtime on vehicles. So those things all happen when close proximity to other vehicles, especially where we're trying to move in a quick fashion to get to an emergency. So we're looking. We will support different ways to try to do it. We leave it to you to figure out the best way to do that. But we are in need of space to get from point A to point B, and having options like painting around hydrants so people know where to park and not where to park, I think it's a great idea. I was just wondering if they, then we could follow up at, at some point just maybe to find out how much that would cost and how feasible, because that seems like a pretty good idea for me, safety-wise. Is that, I guess I would just put that to Linda. Um, we'll come to the issue of whether we're going to close or extend the hearing, okay? Uh, Steve, you had a follow-on question, I believe. <laughs> Question to the superintendent. <laughs> so if the speed is 19 miles an hour where there are no parked cars, can one assume that the speed is actually less where there are parked cars? We only had one counter. <laughs> I have two now, and we actually have a couple more signs we can use that are coming in shortly. We could actually do more data collection along the whole length of Lincoln Avenue to get speeds that are more... We, we used to have like six counters, but they all died. So we were slowly building our counters back up. So we're at the point now, probably in a week, that's when your, your signs come in? The our signs. Your, oh, okay. Our signs come in. Um, we'll have three signs that do counting, and we have two actual counters that do counting and classification. So um, there's five counters, and at that point we could do more, gather more information. But we couldn't do it, and so yeah, until after spring break. Okay. Are there any other questions, Alyssa? Yes, speaking of timing, so um, Mr. Mooring will really appreciate this because he remembers me doing it all the time on Select Board. So it's all well and good to make a change, and it usually takes way, 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 way longer to implement than any of us ever guesses it will. So if we were to, after we close this hearing and we talk about what we're going to do next, if we just accepted carte blanche, everything you suggest here, when realistically, not magically, but realistically, would you propose that the signage would change such that everybody would see? I mean, it's all well and good for us to say effective immediately, but when would the signage actually happen and when would we actually see these changes take place? Right now, we're probably looking at a month. It's about two weeks to get the signs made and because we're doing signs that aren't normal, we would have them made outside. We wouldn't, we, we wouldn't make them ourselves. And since there's going to be a lot of signs, we would buy them from a company. So about two weeks to get the order in, get the order back, and then two weeks to put them all up. So we would say if you make a decision, just give us 30 days, and that's the day it goes into effect, and we'd have everything up by then. And it's nice outside. It's not frozen. It's still it's thawing. Okay. Yes, Mandy Joe. Two questions, one for the assistant fire chief um, and that one is does the fire department and EMS use Lincoln as a cut through to get places um, or is it generally only on that street for actual emergencies on that street so that's my question number one and then the other one I think is for Guilford maybe and that is painting as Sarah said you know we heard that signs get stolen 
regularly. Um, paints are hard to paint over, or at least take a little more effort than stealing a sign. Um, so if there are state regulations that require setbacks from hydrants where there's no parking, because we don't have to institute that, that's just a state regulation or state regulations that say you have to be, by state law, so far away from an intersection and so far away from a driveway, can't we, on this street, paint those parts of those curbs yellow? And would that potentially then, if we did that, solve some of the safety issues that have been part of the concern because there would be larger spaces for cars to pull off if an emergency truck went through. So to answer your question, we do use that street, not necessarily because we're in the station, that's not a direct route to many places other than Lincoln and affiliated streets thereby, but if we're somewhere else, so I'm on South University, or coming up Amy Street, and you tell me I have a call at UMass, then absolutely that's a cutoff street that we would use readily. So as far as painting goes, the easiest place to paint hydrants is on the streets that are in the downtown area with actually have curbing around them because we can paint the curbing and it lasts longer than painting the road. Um, so yes, we could do it. It's, um, we, I would probably give it to the hydrant guys. We hire a couple of seasonals every summer and they go paint hydrants and they repair hydrants with the crew. So they would, we would just paint it. I think red's the color, isn't it? I thought it was yellow. Yellow? Yeah. yeah. We would paint it red or yellow, and then we could, it would probably stay longer if it was on a curbed area. If it's not on a curbed area, um, I would recommend not really painting it, unless you're going to paint spaces on the whole street or something. Are there other questions from the council? OK, so I just want to ask people to Bear with us. This is the first time we've had a hearing like this. And so what the council now needs to do is decide whether they close the hearing or continue the hearing or whatever else they might do. The first action is whether we close or continue. So um, is there a motion? What happens if we do the that's, that's the question I wanted. What happens if we close the hearing? Okay, if we close the hearing and we want to discuss this again in the future, we have to go back and re-advertise, okay? If we leave the hearing, yes, Alyssa? That's not true. So you can this is not planning board and this isn't zoning board of appeals and it's not someplace else that has adjudicatory, that kind of power. This is, we close the hearing and that means we're done hearing from all these mm -hmm. folks. If we said we want to continue the hearing because we're waiting for you to put out two traffic counters and we want to get that data, we could leave it open. But technically, we could, as I understand it, we could close the hearing and we could still say, hey, you know what, we had another question. Come back and answer another question. This is not like an applicant for a particular permit for a particular project that's going to get built or not get built. Okay. So we don't have those kind of constraints. So I would normally argue toward closing the hearing, and then we can still do pretty much whatever we want after that, but the hearing's no longer considered open, and we don't have to re-advertise unless we decide to start talking a lot, unless we decide to start talking about sunset, for example, then we'd need to advertise that. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so we either close the hearing or we don't close the hearing. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Chalini seconded it. Is there any further discussion? Then all those in favor of closing the hearing, please raise your hand and say aye. aye. All those opposed? And abstain? I should have said aye, I'm sorry. I didn't, I was too busy. Okay. So all those in favor Eyes. How many did you have? I had 11 vote. yes, one no, and one abstention. Okay. So the hearing is officially closed. Thank you. And thank you for that. We are going to take a break, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. We're going to reconvene. Um, so... The next item on our agenda is to um, 
in fact decide what we want to do with the proposed parking regulation changes on Lincoln Ave. And the floor is open for discussion. Mandy Jo. So this isn't going to be a surprise, but I'm in favor of referring <laughs> to um, the new town services and outreach committee um, with a hope that they might consider talking to TAC and the town staff about what we heard tonight and other potential options and everything and giving us back a report. Are there other comments at this time before we ask for a motion? Yes, Alyssa. Given that we have something else on the agenda to refer to TSO tonight, we, we already referred some to TSO last meeting, and like they haven't even started yet, um, is I want, I actually, I don't have a problem per se with that, but I actually would like us to talk briefly if, we, if anybody else is interested in this, in increasing those distances from the intersections, because that was, and that's partly because that's what we did in 2015, that was one of the things we focused on then. Clearly it hasn't been enough. And so I'm, that to me is a more immediate issue because, there, I mean, you still have to get enforcement out there. But if people understand not parking so close to the intersections, that seemed to be a public safety concern in terms of getting the vehicles in and out, but also people making the corner safely just in a regular vehicle. And so I'd really like to entertain the idea of making those changes, just those, those couple changes to the intersections, and then refer any other changes to another body. Kathy? Um, I'm just building on Alyssa's, and when we get to the other side of Amity, when you get to where Gaylord is, the map is pretty unusual. If you look at, there's 30 feet there versus 60 feet, so going back and saying, why so small when that small street needs visibility too? So that notion of how far from an intersection should the minimum be 60, I don't know what the right number is, but when you get up to McClellan at 60, then we're at 120, so to, to just go all the way down Lincoln, since we heard that the intersections are problematic at several places. I wanna make sure that if there is such a motion that it's worded with precision, and that may take just a little while to do. Um, so um, if you're planning to make such a motion, please start working on the precise motion. Uh, Kat, uh, yes, Do I, Dorothy. And I, I'm also told not to be so close to my mic, so let me put it away from me. When is the new TSO committee starting? It starts, it's officially appointed as of mo next Monday. And based on the memo that I sent to all of you, I will call the first meeting. I am suggesting that that first meeting be the following Monday at 9.30. And what date would that be? That would be the 23rd. Thank you. Okay. So if this were referred to the new TSO, then it would be considered on that date? No? It would be part of that agenda. There are a couple items that would be considered. So then it might be a long delay before the TSO got a chance to look at it. Okay. Pat. Because of that delay, that's why I think what Alyssa is saying is important about the intersections and that we can do something about that right now. Okay. Could we put up, Athena, could we put up the recommendations section? I think it's right on page one of the memo. And then basically we could just circle all the ones that are the intersection distances as opposed to the stretches. Andy. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because I actually have it on my screen right now. And I think what uh, would be suggested if we did that would be to enact, um, and it's, this is really a first reading, so it would require a second reading anyway, but, but in act as the first readings, subparts one, two, and three on, under recommendations, and um, they probably would need to be read into the motion to avoid confusion, even though it would be easy, because it's cut and paste for the clerk later to do that. And then um, 
I think we would have to then consider a separate motion on referral to a committee for the remainder of the proposal um, as uh, Mandy has suggested. Okay. All right. So, Mandy Joe. So, I'm not sure it would be that easy, but since we couldn't vote on it tonight, I think we could buy next time for the intersection issue get better because those subparts don't include the 60 feet on either side of on McClellan because the proposal is the full length of that side. Okay. So, you know, I think we'd have to look and maybe craft a motion separately if, if that's what people wanted to act on first. Do, do but, we want that to, do we therefore want today to be considered the first reading or does it have to come back with more precision? First, today can be the first reading. So it, we need to have crafted a motion that basically increases the setbacks at the intersections. Yes? Okay. Uh, and, and would that include increasing the setbacks on the block of Lincoln um, between Amity and Northampton Road? Because I, I think that they are smaller the, than they are, i say, around the McClellan, making include, them the same. The motion can include, am I correct? The motion can include those as well. Paul? Just a clarification. So I just want to understand, are you referring, are you saying we want to approve items one, two, and three, and this is the first reading? Or are you referring one, two, and three? No. We're, we're saying that we, we want one, to approve one, two, and three. We want to approve one, two, and three, and this is the first reading. Got it. But we will work it up into a properly worded motion for the second reading, which will be on March 23. Thank you. Which will be on March 23. No, Paul, you're looking at me strangely. That's not our next meeting. Maybe I'm lost on this, but I don't think the council usually acts, takes a motion on our first reading. No, we don't. Okay. We will craft the motion and it will be presented at our second reading, which will be on March 23rd. Yes. I'm looking at these recommendations on that page one of the memo and it seems to have forgotten a number um, it doesn't have the parking prohibited 60 feet on either side of McClellan anywhere in the recommendations. It has the eight to five up to those 60 feet lines, which is four and five, but nothing about the 60 feet on either side. I think we forgot a number somehow. If you look at the map, they circle that as a change, but they built, what Mandy's saying is they built it into a longer sentence rather than doing it the way the number two did it on Gaylord, where it was just explicit on both sides. Okay. Yeah. Can I just say that because this will be in a full motion next time, that kind of thing can be corrected. And am I correct that we can also extend this to the north side of Amity? We can. We don't have to have a separate hearing just to do curb setbacks. I'm sorry. So I feel I don't know why we're talking about the north side is something separate when I feel like that's already in there except and then the only one that's not appropriately covered in one, two, and three is that part about McClellan. And, but the problem is if I understand that we don't like craft a motion for a first reading. But on the other hand, we can't say this whole proposal is under first reading because this whole proposal is not under first reading because we are not right. considering this whole first proposal. So we have to say something's the right. subject of the first we, reading. So we I basically would say have to tear things. the recommendations apart. Right. It's those three things are part of the first reading, and then the wording that Mandy Joe wants for to be you know to be determined associated with McClellan. And when that is put together with then staff can review again on that on the Gaylord just to make sure that they didn't intend for it to be larger. I mean, I believe they intended it to be this, but they can double check it um, to see if that's right. All right. So let me 
make sure I understand this since somebody's got to work with Mr. Bockelman and uh, Athena and that will be staff. We're basically now want to move on the setbacks, increasing the setbacks because we all agree that at a minimum we're going to do that, okay? And that we will have a motion that is explicit and demonstrated on a map for our next meeting, which will be officially the second reading of this portion. Yes? I just want to clarify that we're talking about, um, I have the numbers, the what is in this paper, but with a change that the tow zone on the east and west side of Lincoln Avenue for a distance, instead of it being it, here, it says 30 feet north and south of Gaylord Street, but it says 60 feet north and south of McClellan Street. And I believe there was a, a, a statement by some people here that it should be the same number around Gaylord as around McClellan. You, you didn't say that. We, yeah. Well, we, this is something where we will go back with staff. We will check on the appropriate amounts of setbacks, et cetera, and come back to you with the map and the actual, um, actual motion. Thank Mandy Jo. Are we, uh, this is a question for another part of this recommendation because what we pull out is not going to be part of the referral then. That's correct. And so I'm, I, I wonder if, the council might be ready to move on, I think it's number seven, um, which is prohibiting parking 24 seven on the west side of Lincoln Avenue from essentially Amity to North Hadley. Is that part of a question for this council as to whether we wanna do that or not, or is that something we might be able to move on without further study by a committee? Let me just refresh my memory. Which is, represents no change at all from what we've been told for now. I have a comment here. There's going to be construction by UMass right in that area when they tear down the Lincoln apartments. And there's been great concern about large vehicles, how they're going to get in and out. So I would think that this is, reflects that, that we should keep the 200 feet tow zone around North Hadley, which is way up by the university and very close to the Lincoln Avenue apartments. Number seven says tow zone the whole length of Lincoln from Amity to North Hadley. And I'm wondering whether the council needs that referred or whether they're comfortable with keeping that on sort of the first reading as part right. of a motion next week. Since it doesn't represent a change from what we've been told from what the current regulations are. Yes. Keep, we'll add that to the, this being the first reading, we'll add that to the motion for the second reading. Okay. Then what are we referring? Hmm? Four, five, and six. Four, five, and six. Okay, so I don't need a motion for the first. I need a motion to suspend Rule 8.4 for 4, 5, and 6. Oh, it doesn't? Okay, thank you. All right. So we need a motion to refer 4, 5, and 6 to TSO. So I, I move to refer... Proposed parking regulations under the recommendation numbers four, five, and six, the Monday to Friday, eight to five prohibit, prohibition, and east, well, the east side prohibitions eight to five and permanently from veering to North Hadley. Um, move to refer to the town services and outreach committee with a report back to the council within 90 days. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? I George. Well, George. I just would like 
some help from my colleagues as to what TSO, which has not yet met yet, is supposed to do or what you imagine them doing. Um, they're supposed to take into consideration some of the concerns raised apparently by some of you. Um, are they, I mean, we have a proposal from the staff and there it is. Now you're referring it to TSO and what do you want them to do with this proposal? Do you want them to, I'm, I'm just trying to understand, maybe the council just doesn't want to make a decision about this as it stands. Are you looking for some compromise? Um, you're gonna leave it up to TSO? I would help if you could give TSO some sense of what you expect them to do other than just have it land in their laps. Okay, so let me try to, I think that's an absolutely and appropriate question. Do we want TSO to only look at four, five, and six? That's one option. Do we want TSO to look at some of the broader issues raised today about impacts on other parts of the neighborhood? Do we want TSO to look broadly at things like how wide can a street be in order to have parking on one side or two sides? So that's just giving you a sense of the range of what I believe George is appropriately asking. What do we want TSO to look at? Evan. So one of the things that I, I, I'm thinking, so I'm thinking of this in two ways to respond to George's question. One is this to me is very similar to the recommendations we received from the downtown parking working group where we received recommendations and then we sent them to CRC and said, all right, now we've gotten a proposal what does the council think that these a little bit more? But I think to me, um, there were a lot, of com a lot of questions that were asked of, of um, uh, the superintendent and the chief and where we got the response of, we were, looked at, we were tasked to look at parking on Lincoln. We were tasked to look at parking on Lincoln, which was they weren't looking at this in the context of parking, parking more broadly. They weren't looking at this in, in terms of how might this affect sunset. They were asked something fairly narrow. And I think that's where the committee then broadens the discussion. They were given a task, we have their proposal, and we say, okay, given all of these other things we're looking at, is this something we actually recommend that the town council go forward with? Because I know for me, I have questions that are, are still unanswered, um, especially with regard to potential spillover effects. Um, and I think that's where, that, where the, a committee could become useful. Okay. Steve? Yeah, so I'm ready and willing and able to vote on the parts that we said that we're ready to, willing and able to vote on. For me, I think that four, five, and six are part of a macro problem, much bigger than Lincoln. And I'm not sure that, I'm still uncomfortable talking about Lincoln when these might be other problems. Because we can think of all kinds of other streets that have these, we've been hearing from uh, people during the break that they've had all kinds of problems on this street and that street. Nobody's answer, answered their emails. So I am, you know, kudos to Lincoln for getting this on the docket. But there's all kinds of other problems uh, out there, including Taylor Street, right in my neighborhood. So I, would, I think that the issue is, rather than referring four, five, and three, four, and five to the TS, whatever it is, to yep. the TSO, I would rather see a strategic methodology for looking at when we deal with parking issues and when we don't deal with them. Pat. I actually would like to vote on four, five, and six because tonight, and then refer all of the parking to, to TSO spillover. How you know Lincoln Avenue versus Churchill Street for you know to a uh, real looking at the broader issue. Um, but I'm ready to vote on four, five, and six. Dorothy, I just want to be sure about six. I think that's what it has always been. So I think we should be talking about four and five, the eight to five, because there's a reason why parking has been prohibited uh, in six, and it has to do with very narrow roads and uh, streets. Yeah, uh, Paul has an answer here. Paul. The motion states repeal all existing regulations, mm -hmm. and this is substituting this. So we have a clean slate for all the regulations that are gonna be on Lincoln are gonna be applied uh, based on this vote. 
So even though they're pre-existing, the first phrase is repeal existing parking regulations and replace. So if you didn't replace six, there would, that would not exist anymore. So my question is why is that controversial? Because that, that really is not really part of it. It's, it's a much narrower area. It, it, basically, when you repeal, you repeal the whole set. And even as you bring back pieces that you already have, you bring them back and state them the way they are. So it's, I know that, but we, we were look, doing four and five because there's a lot of discussion that needs to take place about that. You're and, right that four and five really is the only thing that would change. And so therefore, it is the only thing that would probably go to TSO. Mandy Jo. So um, I actually don't agree with six. If we're looking at eight to five on four and five, I will state right now I am disagreeing. At this point, I disagree with having Fearing to North Hadley different than McClellan to Fearing. And I'm not sure why they're different. I didn't get tremendous answers. I think that's something that TSO could help me with. I think even if those three are referred, TSO can come back with what might the bigger problem be if we do adopt it here. What are all the other streets that are the same width that have parking on both sides that then residents might say, well, you did it to Lincoln. Here's where we might be facing it so that I know what the scope of this potential change, the, the, the outcomes of this potential change are to the rest of the town when other, everyone else finds out, oh, we just limited it here, we'll do it for mine because mine's the same with street or where that overflow might be. So I agree with Evan that it needs there, but I, I can say at this point, I'm not sure I could vote for number six because I'm not clear why on a road that is the same width we're treating one small portion of it completely different than others. That was answered by, it was a very transient area, crazy parking, of uh, student uh, apartments with many, many cars, and that the police found it a very difficult area. So that's why they, they did answer that amongst many thousands of other things today. May I also say that as long as it's referred, it stays the way it is until such time as it comes back and there is a recommended change. So we aren't repealing and replacing in this motion at all, we're referring. Alyssa. Thank you, because yeah, we, the repeal and replace went away when we decided to call the first three things something we were putting under our first reading and then we added in seven? Yes. We added part, one, two, part three, of five. And seven. Well, it's one, two, three, part of five, Right, because we said that we needed to have that distance. So it's one, two, and three for sure. It's five revisited by staff to tell us what's the equivalent of that setback for that intersection. And then seven, because seven is currently existing conditions that we're just reaffirming. Yes. Sarah. So I think one of the other things that I would wonder if TSO could do for us is that there was a lot of like suggestions about maybe safety things that could be done. And I wouldn't want those also to be ignored. So maybe that would be also something like, could we paint those areas by driveways or by fire hydrants? Like I think that, that when we talked about all these different things, I think that there was other facets of how to help that street out. And so I would like to be able to kind of have a little bit of a more of a comprehensive plan, whether we take all of it or not, but I think TSO could help in sort of examining some of the other things that were said. So can I suggest that we might make the motion for TSO to come back with a plan for how they want to proceed versus sitting here and trying to craft exactly what we want them to do, unless it is that we want them to come back with a re recommendation regarding the rest of, of Lincoln Ave, basically the remainder parts of four, five, and six, and then separately we want them to do come back with a plan. It's something that allows them to be responsive to this proposal, but also recognize that there's lots of other issues. Shalini. Yeah, in addition to the safety issues, 
Um, regarding with respect to intersection, I just want to highlight the backing is the other area. So if that's another thing for the TSO to look at with the safety issues. And also the question about how are we treating this uh, public parking as a resource for the community and the people that it's affecting. So to address that as well. We keep this up and we're gonna to have to rename TSO. Um, let's not get into that one, okay? Thank you. Um, so, is there a motion with regard to referral to TSO? Which is four, five, and six. And it was seconded. Yes. Is there any further discussion? Alyssa. Sorry, was it 90 days? 90 days. Okay, 90 days. And that's, remember, our, our thing of report. That doesn't, that report can be, we're still working on it. <laughs> right. All right. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All those in favor of the referral to TSO with a report back in 90 days for items four, five, and six of the recommendations. Raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? I'm waiting, keep your, do you have them all? Abstain. Okay, all right. Oh, I'm sorry, what was the final vote? It was 10-3. I thought it was 9-4. Okay, please raise your hand again. All those in favor? In favor, in favor. Opposed? Got it. Abstain, none. So it's nine to four, thank you. Um, okay. So, so Lynn, just on the, the setbacks, the amount of space on intersection, we're keeping that and we're gonna come back to it next, next time we next meet? Next time, okay. it'll be a second reading next time. Okay, and can we have that request be the second reading if people really meant 30 on Gaylord and 60 on McKellen? So just get that yes, clarified. Yes, we'll go back and clarify with them. Okay. Okay. They're, they're, it's also possible that they, based on the hearing, they may decide that it's appropriate to change it too. That's, um, that's, what, I'd, that's what I would hope. Okay, <laughs> Dorothy. Can we call them tow-away zones rather than setbacks? Because setback is a term we use meaning something else with buildings. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. We're moving on to the finance committee charge. Andy? Oh, actually, GOL, let's start with you. You're doing finance committee charge. Yes. So um, you have in your packet both the clean and the track changed version of the finance charge? Yep. Mm -hmm. And you've studied it carefully? Yes. So I can ask you all questions about it? Yes. Good. Um, we had the uh, pleasure of having Andy Steinberg come and speak to us, and he brought to us suggestions from the Finance Committee, which we considered and we asked Andy questions, and what you have in front of us is the result of that conversation. We had already voted this once before, but in our generous and magnanimous spirit, we did it again. So what you have now is the revised version of the revised version. 
Um, the changes that are made, um, if you're looking at the track changes, um, a piece of the purpose that it was in the original document has been moved down to the charge. So where it says consider all, any or all questions which it deems appropriate for the purpose of considering the budget and it refers to Charter 5.5B. Um, that, so that's not really a change, it's just moving something from the purpose to the charge. The word finances was added to under the charge where it says finance, finance shell colon. The word finances was added at the recommendation of the Finance Committee. Um, the seventh bullet point, we had a fair lengthy discussion about upon referral from the council. Um, it had been recommended by the Finance Committee that that be removed and the final decision by our committee was that we preferred to leave it in. So it was left in and um, there was a bullet, you can see a bullet point that was suggested by finance. It's stricken with the lines through it. That was discussed at some length and then we decided not to put it in. So we did not make a lot of changes to this, um, but the two that might be of some issue have to do with upon referral from the council in bullet seven and the fact that we did not take the suggestion uh, which says consider and make recommendations, um, all other financial measures, et cetera. We decided not to include that. Other than that, uh, there was agreement between the Finance Committee and GOL and we voted this document 4-0 um, with one absent to be clear, consistent and actionable and now it's in front of you. Is there a motion? You have to have a motion first before you amend. Okay. <laughs> Is there a motion? Mandy Jo. So I'll, I'll make a motion to rescind the current finance committee charge and adopt the proposed finance committee charge, quote, finance charge, GOL voted 2020-02-26 clean as presented effective immediately. It, okay, so the motion's been made and seconded. Kathy. Okay, I'm, I appreciate the changes that were made that came out of finance, and I would like to make one um, additional change to the document we're looking at. The bullet that was completely removed, um, when we discussed at finance, the purpose of that was to open up and make it clear that the finance committee in its role as thinking about financial matters might at times um, originate an idea. It could be about revenues or other issues. So it was meant to be parallel to what we saw in other committees, but I don't think as well worded as it could have been. So what I'd like to put back in, add back to, not change anything, but add one more uh, general statement that would be review and make recommendations to the town council on matters related to the financial health of the town of Amherst. And if we cross-looked over to CRC and some of the other committees, they have this general wording. Um, and I found when I was looking at finance committees in other yeah. cities I, and can towns. I, can I just get a second and then? Oh, OK. So uh, is there a second? So I shouldn't explain why first. OK. OK, now, go ahead. OK, so it's, it's a general, it opens up the possibility um, there's a revenue idea that comes up. There's some issues that we haven't specifically been talking about, but we want to bring them to attention. So this review and make recommendations, which is very similar to the wording used in a CRC in their, with their focus. And I looked at Cambridge and a, a lot of other cities and towns, and they, um, ex they do more general language generally than we do. Uh, they're not as specific, but there is this broad intent that, um, that you could originate, you could be creative in a committee. Um, you wouldn't have to just uh, work on the budget issues. So I think this opens up that as a possibility um, that is parallel to the way we've done in other committees. So to clarify, this would make bullet eight Athena, yes. Yes. Could you put the... But can I ask that Councilor Shane repeat? The I'm sorry? Should I read it again? Repeat the motion. Okay, so I'm, I'm proposing that we add an additional bullet to the list that's under uh, budget and finances, so it would be the, on a new last bullet. 
that would be review and make recommendations to the town council on matters related to the financial, financial health of the town of Amherst. That motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Then we'll vote on the amendment to the motion first. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay. So it's 11-1-1. Thank you. And now we're back to the main motion. The main motion is to adopt this, is to get rid of the other charge and basically adopt this charge. Is there any further discussion? I was just gonna say, I, I move that we adopt the charge as amended. It's, all, it's already been moved and seconded. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Yes, no, and that vote was unanimous. unanimous. Okay, great. Thank you. Moving on. We are now at the Mullen Rule, and Paul, you wrote the memo on this. Do you want to speak to it, please? Sure. So the Mullen Rule is a. Uh, well, you, you have the memo in front of you. It's a section of the general law, the Massachusetts general laws, that allows a, um, a member of a committee to um, participate in a, dis, in, a dis, in a vote of a decision in front of it, an adjudicatory committee typically. Um, if they've missed one session, uh, as long as they attest that they've viewed the minutes or the recording of that session. So currently, this is, can be, was, was approved to be utilized by the Select Board Planning Board Conservation Commission and the Historical Commission, and the request is to allow the Zoning Board of Appeals and the local Historic District Commission to utilize the Mullen Rules as well. The vote required is for the Town Council to allow those two boards uh, to utilize the Mullen Rule. Are there questions? Mandy Joe. So I noticed the original town meeting action included the select board on the bot list of bodies that could utilize the Mullen rule. At that time, they were our license commissioners or the equivalent of the license commissioners. I'm wondering, wondering if there's any need potentially for the town council to be included on this motion. We do sometimes have hearings on water and sewer rates. I don't know whether that was the reason the select board was included in it, but is there something that we should be, is there a reason we could potentially be looking at including the town council on this? There could, there could be other committees that could avail themselves of this, um, Board of Health, for instance, or uh, license, Board of License Commissioners. I'm not sure about the town council, if there would any, be anything that you are doing in terms of an adjudicatory hearing that requires attendance at all the hearings before you make a decision. Um, but these are the two committees that have requested this. Alyssa. Since it doesn't involve killing dogs or doing um, alcohol licensing, which were two responsibilities the select board had before, I don't believe that we yeah. any that, longer do have that. Thank so thank you. And okay. this is, we did waive our rule associated with this so that we could do this tonight as opposed to having to do, that was what we were going to do and then Darcy asked that we not do that. And so are we, we still, since we didn't waive our rule under the consent calendar, if we want to act on this tonight, we still have to waive the rule separately for this item. Can I ask another question? Is there any reason any other board you can um, think of that should be under this? Uh, so again, is, is the only two that we could think of in talking with the town attorney were the Board of Health and the um, um, Board of License Commissioners. And again, this was prompted by, a, by an action by the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Historic District Commission because they had a pretty lengthy hearing they, they felt the need for it as well. We haven't felt the need from it from the other commissions yet. You could offer it, but 
um, we, I would bring, suggest that we bring that back as a separate action. Okay, thank you. Alyssa? Yeah, I, it, we talked, Paul and I talked briefly about Board of Health, and it does make sense to either wait for them to ask. This does not, unlike most things, it's not a wise thing to be proactive about. This is a case where they might not want to do that as a board. They might not want to give their own members the option of doing that. And also, remember, there's this, you have to file the form that says you've listened listen to an audio recording, right now there might not be audio recordings okay. of those particular meetings, and so they wouldn't be able to do it. Thank you. Kathy? Um, I only, I had a comment on this, um, that at one point uh, during the summer, I tried to, uh, a Zoning Board of Appeals hearing that I wasn't able to attend, I wanted to look at the minutes of it, and I discovered there were no minutes. They don't do minutes, um, so I couldn't, find what's going on, and they don't do a video, so you, I couldn't watch what had happened. And there is an audio tape that I then just, uh, staff sent me one. They aren't great. Um, it was okay, and I finally figured out a way of making it work, but I think it's important in waiving this that there's a very good audible tape that if the idea is you, you miss the hearing, but want to know what's going on that you can hear. Because I, I had to do a lot of jerry-rigging with my laptop to get the sound loud enough to actually hear the discussion back and forth because it's more like an after, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't these kind of recordings. So I, I think the, the sentiment here, you know, I know with planning board you can actually watch the video or you could watch ours. So I just want to make sure we have the capacity to produce um, a good audio tape. No, I'm not doubting. I just the, my one experience with it is I had to struggle to to find it. Okay. Any other questions at this time? All right. Then let's go to. Um, we first need a motion to suspend the council rules. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So the motion is to suspend council rules for procedure. Rule 8.4 for the current agenda item. It's been made and seconded. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. And the vote was? I'm sorry? Okay, unanimous. All right, now, then we're going to move on to the actual motion. And that motion is to accept for the following boards, committees, and commit or commissions holding a judicatory hearing in the town, the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 39, Paragraph 23D, which provide that a member of a board, committee, or commission holding a judicatory hearing shall not be disqualified from voting in the matter solely due to the member's absence from one session of such hearing, provided that certain conditions as established by said statute are met. Zoning Board of Appeals, Local Historic District Commission. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? Darcy, I just want to make sure you were the one that asked that we pull this off the consent agenda. Is there any further question on your part? Okay, thank you. Then all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstained. Abstain. Abstain. So 12 to 1, 0. Sarah, did you oppose? Oh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> okay. No, we're fine. We're fine. Her hand was up too long. Thank you. Okay. We're moving on to um, the bylaw amendment on non-criminal disposition uh, 2.2. This is the first reading, and George, I believe we come back to GOL. Yes, um, we uh, voted this clear, consistent, and actionable on the February 26th meeting. Uh, the vote was 4 to 0 with one member absent. And um, I think our comments are in the report, which I can read to you, but you can read it better than I can. Um, Mandy also could speak to this perhaps more uh, strongly, but uh, we found it clear, consistent, and actionable. Okay. Is there any qu further question on this? 
Okay, this is our first reading. It will come back on the March 23rd agenda. No questions? All right, then moving on to the Town Council Rules of Procedure, Rules 8.2, 8.6, and 10.3. Again, first discussion, first reading. Uh, this is, uh, again, GOL. It, this is really just a housekeeping measure, and so I'm kind of wondering why we have to go through the two readings. Uh, basically, what we're asking you to do here is um, we're just replacing um, OCA with uh, TSO, I believe. I have the document in here somewhere, but essentially it's just housekeeping as a result of the changes we made at the last meeting in terms of permanent standing councils of the committee of the council. So given those changes, certain changes had to be made in wording to 8286 and 10.3. And if you look in your packet, you'll see it's strictly housekeeping. Um, okay. Just changing out, swapping out names. Great. Is there any question on this? Pat. I just wonder why something like that couldn't have been on the consent agenda since it was just a wording It's change. a change to our rules of procedure which requires two readings. Okay. So we'll just quickly go through, read it once, come back to, on March 23rd. Maybe it'll be on the consent agenda next week? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a note of that. And maybe we can put the chapter, the uh, non-criminal disposition on consent too. Okay, all right. Uh, we're going on to appointments and you've received three memos from me the first is the actual presidential appointments to uh, the committees, um, the standing committees of the council, and as soon as I find my memo. Um, this appears in your document, it was also sent to you. So that um, I do reappoint outreach communications and appointments. They will continue until June 30th. They only have one charge. And that is basically to do the appointments for uh, the um, ZBA and planning board, um, which essentially continues them almost as an ad hoc committee um, with that one single focus. Um, the finance committee was previously named. The uh, new appointments are um, for governance, organization, and legislation. Town Services and Outreach Committee and Resource Community Resources Committee. And in every instance, I state the time in the agenda. Uh, I had to change my time for one of them, uh, for two of them. And let me just say that I will be at the first meeting of each of those three uh, as we elect the chair, and I will organize the first meeting for TSO by consulting with the members on that committee and would like to know for the members on that committee whether Monday, um, it's a, so it would be the week after the town council meeting. So the ne first time it would meet would be next Monday, the 16th. <laughs> you cannot meet, okay. Okay, then the following time that we could meet, or maybe I'll, at this point, I'll just poll the committee, find out when you can meet, and we'll try to meet as soon as possible, okay? Because OCA is not actually meeting. Uh, it's ch schedule is slightly changed. Um, three, it meets 3.30 and 4.13 currently, is my understanding. So the, if you want to work around those dates, for instance, uh, TSO could meet on the 23rd. So OCA is meeting? On 3.30. O o OCA actually it tried to intentionally get its meetings off of the town council mornings right. okay. um, when possible. And so okay. our schedule actually, it, it's a little bit incorrect there. And so when are you meeting? You're meeting on? Uh, uh, March 30th, uh, and then April again 13th. on April 13th. And what time? 9.30 to 11.30. So same day, same time, but just the different dates. I got it. Yeah. So in theory, TSO okay. could meet on the 23rd. All right, I will poll TSO and move forward. Um, I also want to just point out on the memo, there were two places where I did not properly recognize somebody who had served in a previous committee, and that is the diagonal line through, and that would be Evan Ross previously served 
and continues to serve on outreach communications and appointments, and he did serve on GOL. So the next memo is your choice. All I did was the polling. We already have JCPC, and it's been up and running, and Kathy Shane is now the chair of that. Uh, participatory budget, budgeting commission is up and running, and we had, that commission finishes at the end of December, and so I didn't see any reason to change people off. Besides, I believe it was a two-year appointment. So budget coordinating group, three councilors expressed interest. The way the present charge reads, it's two from finance. The councilors that expressed interest in this are Councilor Brewer, Griesmer, and Shane. Is there a motion? Yes, Mandy Jo. I move to approve the following town council appointments to the budget coordinating group under rules of procedure 10.6. Councilors appointed to committees named in the charter, effective Im immediately um, for a term to expire January 6th, I don't know, one year from like it's January 6th. January 6th, 2021. Um, Lynn Griesemer and Kathy Shane. Is there a second? second. George, a second. Is any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. You abstained? Okay, so it's 12-01. All right, the next one, I, um, I did not recommend, but just communicated to you who expressed interested, interest in being liaisons um, and what their ranking was and so affordable housing at this point, no one has expressed interest. Is there a change in that? Okay, then we will not have a liaison to that. It, and Board of Health, the three people that expressed interest were Brewer, Ryan, and Pam. And uh, so at some point we need to select one of them all those in favor say aye. <laughs> right. Okay. I will step back. I, I will volunteer to be a, a liaison with affordable housing. Okay. All right. And you're taking your name off Board of Health. Yes. And that leaves Ryan and Brewer. Okay. And the next one also leaves Ryan and Brewer. Shall we flip a coin? Okay. I will yield to my colleague. All right. <laughs> so. but I actually have a, a more serious question, but perhaps this isn't the time. And so I, I will let the president decide what she wants to do. What is your serious question? Well, if you look at this list, um, seven counselors did not ex express any willingness to serve on, as a liaison. That's a majority of the counselors. An eighth counselor only put down one, and, and a ninth counselor put down two. So it seems to me that the majority of counselors really are not uh, committed to this idea. So perhaps, in spite of all the work that Lynn has done and Oka has done and other people have done, it seems that the council has voted with its feet. And so I'm wondering if at this point we just need to throw in the towel and say until, maybe there's something for the retreat to discuss, but just based on sheer numbers, um, um, half of us are going to do this and half of us, or more than half of us are not. And I think if we're not all in, I'm not sure why we're doing it. That's my problem. Sarah. So when I was, I do believe in liaisons, and when I was trying to decide, I actually, I actually, I will be honest, thought probably I would end up being on TSO. And then I thought if I was on TSO, I probably would want to counsel on aging, and I probably would want to be with people with disabilities, because I thought that that would, be a good place for liaisons, but actually now I'm wondering with CRC and its scope, if those two things might fit more handily there. So I'm more than willing to handle, but I, those are ones that already have, um, that already have people who are interested. But if, I mean, I could also do LSSE if it wasn't, 
if Dorothy didn't, if she was like. Where am I crossing you off? Okay, and I'm putting Schwartz there. And Sarah, you've also said Council on Aging, but Pat, you're there. Sarah, do you want Council on Aging? Okay, all right. Um, and Community Preservation, Kathy, you're there and also Pat. And Pat, you're also on disability. Sarah. Kathy, you're on CPAC and you've got transportation. Been going to CPAC and learned a lot. So I, you know, I, you know that was, I was worried about what we would do as we continue this. So I've gone to every meeting and would like to continue doing that. I, my, the other one I put down was TAC, and there is, uh, as we can see, there are lots of people that want TAC. So I'm happy to give up TAC. <laughs> um, can I also just point out CPAC is almost done for the year, isn't it? Yeah, it's. At most, one more meeting right now. The decisions have all been made. Yeah. So that's the reason. That's okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, disability. Brewer, DeAngelis, and Ryan. You're happy to give it up, did you say? Somebody else wants it more. I got Board of License Commissioner. And Sarah, you, I've got you down for two, though. You mentioned disability, but. Yeah. Pat wants disability. Got it. And transportation advisory. Ryan, Pam, and Dumont. Oh, I'm sorry, LSSE, Pam, Sarah, Sarah said yes, she wanted it, and Dorothy, Dorothy withdrew. Yes, and transportation advisory, uh, Darcy, you're the only one there that doesn't have any. Uh, Dorothy and uh, George, how do you feel? Okay, George. Happy to yield to Darcy. All right, so I'm going to make the following motion and look for a second. The motion is to appoint the following counselors as stated as liaisons to Trans affordable housing, Counselor Dorothy Pam. Board of Health, Counselor George Ryan. Board of License Commissioners, Councillor Alyssa Brewer. Community Preservation Act Committee, Councillor Shane. Council on Aging, Councillor Sarah Schwartz. Disability Advisory and Access Advisory Committee, Councillor DeAngelis. Uh, LSSE Commission, Councillor Schwartz. And Transportation Advisory Committee, Councillor Darcy Dumont. Is there a second? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Thank you. That went a lot faster than I thought it was going to. <laughs> All right. Uh, we are moving on to um, committee reports. Community Resources Committee, Mandy Joe. We always get, I'm not used to going first in committee reports still. Um, so we are moving along with um, trying to figure out how to craft a comprehensive housing policy. We will be having a second discussion this coming week on that, um, and that will continue to be on agendas and for the foreseeable future at this point. Um, we have a draft process for getting zoning bylaw changes and proposals through the, all the required steps in state law, in the charter, in all of that, um, that has been to the planning board for brief discussion, has been to CRC once, and is coming back this week to that. Hopefully we can have that to the council soon. Um, and we will also be working on the master plan update. We had elected and um, 
Councillor DeAngelis over here as our representative to the planning board for the master plan update. Unfortunately, she is no longer going to be on CRC, so we will be electing someone else, but we thank her for her willingness um, to serve on that. It is my understanding in terms of just trying to update on zoning, and I'll try to have a written report on some zoning, potential zoning bylaw changes coming forth as I get more next week, but I believe the planning board is looking at a zoning bylaw change on voting quantums for um, special permits, I think it is. And so that will probably be our first test of a draft process for working its way through all of the required um, state law and charter requirements for that. Um, it's been billed as a um, update because the planning board changed in size from nine to seven and there was a bylaw that did not change its voting quantum for that in accordance with that reduction and therefore we're trying, the planning board is trying to update that to sort of match that charter change in size. So that should be coming soon. I haven't seen any actual language yet, but I know it's in process. Okay, yes, Dorothy. So you, I, you've almost answered my question, which is the new CRC is going to meet in two days, is that correct? No. No, no. no. So, so the old CRC will meet one more time this Wednesday because right. the new committees, I, I thank Lynn for this, the new committees do not take effect until next Monday so that the current CRC, as, the, the one that has been meeting, can meet one final time to clean up some stuff and send stuff over to the new TSO that um, it needs to do and, and do all of that. So so okay. we look forward to having you, Dorothy, and Andy, um, and Pat join us on Wednesday morning. If we don't, we won't have a quorum. <laughs> okay. And new members of CRC, are, of course, are welcome to attend. Yes, yes um, absolutely. Okay. Wednesday morning at 8.30. Uh, Finance Committee, Andy. So, uh, Finance Committee, you have received in writing with a number of attachments, so I'm just going to kind of repeat what they are, what we covered, and then um, really just treat it as a matter if there are questions, but trying not to go through the material that has been previously presented. Um, the discussion uh, first was about the audit and the meeting with um, Tanya Campbell from Alance and Heath. Um, and uh, there was a, several pieces that you've received at various times, including the entire and rather lengthy audit report itself. And uh, the, uh, the, the PowerPoint that she presented as part of her presentation and having served on previous audit committees under our old form of government, I actually really appreciated the change that came about by getting to the Finance Committee, and I mentioned this, and that is that um, we've never before had a presentation of the audit in a meeting that was actually televised and the, in therefore a, a really public meeting. And, um, the PowerPoint um, was uh, done at my suggestion in order to both help the committee and help the public, and I hope help the council. Um, but if there are any questions about it uh, beyond what um, I wrote in the report or about what I wrote in the report, um, I'll treat that as uh, the, um, appropriately. The other audit issue has is, is already been taken care of, um, which was the motion to um, retain Melanson Heath for one more year, and um, to, implicit in that is beginning a process that was started by the previous audit committee to um, have a um, selection process for an, um, an audit, audits for a future term. Um, the, the last item that was discussed was something that um, used to go to um, town meetings and select boards, and that's the second quarter financial report. Uh, we received the report. Um, I asked that it be appended to, included in this packet. 
um, just because I, I, I felt that it was important to have it there, though I do know that uh, the town manager also appended it by reference in um, his report. So I think that is what we did at the last meeting, and um, we are not meeting again in, until two weeks from now. Um, so if there are any questions, um, otherwise my report is done. Okay. Any questions? Okay, G-O-L, George. We are uh, going to continue to look at uh, Rule 8.4 and other rules related to the referral process in the illusion that we might be able to move things along more quickly. Um, we're going to look at consent agendas and see if they need to be put into our rules of procedure. Um, and of course, we're still mulling how to proceed with bylaw changes and revisions as referred to you a number of meetings ago, referred to, to us by you. And of course, we still continue to look at the public ways process and um, hope to make some progresses there at, as well. Okay. Lynn, I, I just Kathy. have a request on the bylaws that were referred. Um, the one that I had questioned when we were reviewing them was we removed entirely a bylaw on, on co-op and condo conversion. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we said would be a fuller discussion of if we wanted one of those at all, what should it be? Um, so if you could notify me when you might get to that, because um, I collected other towns and what they've done, you know, just um, so I could just come. Can I ask that there also be a general, there, there's a general request that people whose issues, like for instance, Percent for Art is coming up for GOL, and I uh, did want to make sure that Bill Kazin knew that it was coming up, and so I let him know. But would chairs of committees in the future let people who were either part of that or interested in it know that it's coming up on the agenda, if at all possible? Darcy. Uh, I also wanted to mention the single-use plastic container bylaw. I, I didn't see it um, in the list of future bylaw issues coming up, so maybe it was in some other category, I don't know. But um, I know we had a time limit for when it was going to come back, uh, which yes. I can't remember. I can't remember what the date was, but um, it was there, it's there for a finite amount of time. Mm -hmm. right. Any further questions for GOL? JCPC, Kathy? Kathy? JCPC. JCPC. That's uh, Kathy in her new role. We, we had the, um, I guess it was the second meeting and the first meeting of considering an actual proposal. And it was the only proposal. We only had one proposal this year from a resident proposal. And this one was particularly interesting because it came from two high school students. Um, we're uh, uh, talking about potential solar panels over the parking lot or on the roof. But what was being proposed is a study on where and how you might do them, what the options might be. Um, so we, we had a dis, uh, discussion about that and then a preview. And I, um, in my new role as chair, should have put in some notes into to tonight's. But um, the new procedure that we're going to be going through for those who want to come to meetings, is the entire town side, which is police, fire, and all the departments, will all be in one meeting this year, rather than come in separately. And the town manager is doing a lot of meeting in advance in the attempt to come in with a more consolidated proposal. So next week, um, well actually this week, now we're meeting with library and schools. And so the agenda is put up. You can see what the issues are coming up, each of them. And there's a response. We put this in the town manager's performance goals, and we said this at the end of last year, that uh, trying to come up with five years worth of JCPC, where not just the first year, but the other years were more or less in balance, you know, rather than 
saying we can't do everything this year, so we'll put it to next year, but we'll be in a deficit next year, but trying to think that through. So it's gonna be a very different process this year on trying to see how quickly we can get to that. So. Am I correct that you're meeting this week, but not next week? Yes, I just misstated. Okay. It's, the meetings are on Wednesdays at 5.30. Okay. Any further questions for JCPC? Okay. Um, Oka, Evan? Yep. So Oka is focused around two things right now. One is uh, we are looking at the community activity forms. Um, for potential recommended revisions to hopefully make them more useful and also returning to the conversation that's been lingering in a lot of these conversations about um, whether or not to maintain them as personnel records or for them to be public documents and what it even means for it to be a public document if so. Uh, so stay tuned for more information and recommendations from OCA on that front. Uh, more pressing, uh, Many of you are all aware we've had a vacancy on the ZBA since September 11th. We have, have a regular member. We received recently a resignation from an associate member effective immediately. Um, and we also have the chair of the ZBA who originally had submitted his resignation. Uh, he was only appointed for a one year term that was going to expire June 30th. Uh, he had decided to leave early. He had given us March 13th as his early departure date. Uh, it sounds like, I don't know what his new departure date is, but it sounds like he is going to serve beyond that um, because he's currently impaneled on a, on a project, so he's at least going to see that project out. Um, but what that means is that of the nine potential uh, seats when you combine associate and regular members on the ZBA, uh, we're about to be down to five of them being filled, um, which puts the ZBA in a really precarious position. And so OCA is looking to move on the ZBA. Uh, we do have an applicant pool. Uh, this morning, OCA took the first steps towards moving uh, to fill those vacancies, so we declared the pool sufficient this morning to proceed to interviews. That doesn't necessarily mean sufficient to fill all of the vacancies, but sufficient to proceed to interviews to maybe fill one, two, or all of them. Uh, we also adopted selection guidance um, to guide those interviews, which you know what that means because you all did this recently with the planning board is we will now be moving to develop interview questions and set up interviews. Um, and so as we did last time, you should expect an email from me, uh, probably not tonight at this point, but probably tomorrow um, with the, a reminder of what our process is and with the adopted selection guidance uh, for the ZBA asking you to submit uh, if you have interview questions that you would like us to include for the ZBA interviews. Um, so that'll give the council an opportunity to submit them. And then we will be developing those interview questions at our next meeting on March 30th. And of course, once we have an interview date, um, I will make sure the council is aware of that. Okay, any questions? Okay, for San I really don't, that's going to GOL and then we'll be potentially excuse me, potentially on our next agenda, depending on GOL's actions based on the attorney's recommendations, okay? Can I ask, did we get the attorney's recommendations? We did. We did. Oh, I'm sorry, did we? No. No, I didn't we did think not. we did yet. Right. Um, I'm sure the town manager will be on the phone tomorrow morning. Thank you. <laughs> He's just right for the, I was on the phone Friday and today. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. We appreciate that. Um, and so, and just ignore the next one for TSO. We put it on there because we know we have to put it on there for the future. And as I said before, we'll pull for the meeting. Um, we've already taken care of the minutes. We're moving on to the town manager's report. Thank you. Um, I have a few things I want to mention then. There's a big thing I want to talk about at the end. So Cup of Joe is Friday at Jake's uh, at the mill, and I'll be with the assistant town manager and native son of North Amherst, uh, David Zomack. Um, we have a team working very hard on the complete count. People will start very soon to receive, uh, be receiving in their mailboxes, if they have mailboxes, the um, letter asking to participate in the United States Census as differentiated from the town census. So it's really important, uh, and there's been a lot of effort to educate people 
that everyone participate in the census, that you, re you, um, re that you reply to it and you include everybody in your household, including children, it helps Massachusetts, it helps the town of Amherst. Um, the town elections went off very well. It's our town clerk's first real election, and I really give credit to our town clerk and the entire staff who helped and were working 20-hour days that day to make sure everything went well. And um, we didn't. We we had enough ballots for everybody, and everybody um, <laughs> did did well. Um, very very pleased with the outcome. Very large turnout. Um, crisis mo crisis time for us. Um, so really terrific. We met today actually to start preparing for the September uh, election, the September state primary and the November um, election. There will not be early voting for the September primary, but there will be uh, extensive early voting for the November and uh, election. We're going to be work, trying to work with uh, UMass this spring to set up the early voting for the fall because once they get back, when students get back in the fall, there's not a lot of time before they organize themselves. So if we can get that set up this spring, that's our, our goal. Um, just And also just to note, you know, uh, Mr. Steinberg noted that the um, quarterly finance report uh, was included in your packet. Every quarterly finance report is posted online. There's a link to to it in my town manager report, but we automatically post those quarterly finance reports onto the town's website for uh, several years now. Um, the big thing I want to talk about was uh, COVID-19. So um, we've been pretty much uh, spending an enormous amount of time preparing for COVID-19, uh, the, the coronavirus for the last several weeks now. Um, as of 4 p.m. today, there are 13 new uh, presumptive positive cases bringing the total in Massachusetts, bringing the total of confirmed and presumptive positive cases to 41. Of the 13 new cases, nine are associated with the Biogen conference. Of the 41, 32 are associated with Biogen. None of the 41 are in Hampshire County, although five are in Berkshire County. So the message we've been sending to people is that we are on it. Uh, we have systems in place and we have experienced staff. Um, we're on it meaning that we're, we've been paying close attention and paying and managing and monitoring the situation for since uh, January. Um, having systems in place means that both the public safety arm of things and the public health arm of things are aligned and communicating at a very high level. So the public safety side is through MEMA and the Hampshire County Emergency Management Team, of which our fire chief is, is part of that. And our public health side is coming down through the Department of Public Health, it flows down usually typically from the Centers for Disease Control at the federal level uh, to the Department of Public Health at the state level to the local health uh, department. We're a little bit different than the rest of the country in that we don't have counties. So every, every town has its own board of health. Um, we recognize that we have a sort of a leadership role in this area and our, our team takes a leadership role for our smaller communities who might not have as robust a organization as we do. Um, so those two arms, public health and public safety, are linked in two of our top leaders in uh, Tim uh, Nelson, who is our fire chief, and Julie Fetterman, who's our uh, health director. Um, so they're both working very cooperatively. We've established a core team that includes the police chief, uh, Scott Livingstone, um, because not only the public safety, but also he's in charge of the dispatch unit, which is highly important it, whenever there's a call for anything. It always goes to the 911. So, and uh, David Zomek is our public information officer. So that is our core team. We have an expanded team that supports that core team. Core team. The way we are approaching this has been through our first thing is what's called force protection. And that means that you're ensuring that your own staff are able to respond to emergencies. Police and fire do this as a, by habit. They, they, they have systems in place, they're really good at it. But we have to make sure that if uh, our, any of our employees are exposed, that they are taken care of. Um, and so that goes for everybody uh, in terms of decision makers and things like that. And so force protection is our first thing. Incident command is the next thing. There will be a case in Amherst at some point. It's coming. Uh, it's, it's considered um, 
uh, it's not like we're going to get hit by a tornado, but it's like a big wave, a tsunami coming, and we can see it, and we have time to prepare. That's the good news, as the fire chief says. It's good news is we have time to prepare, and we are using that time wisely. Um, so the incident command is when there's something that happens, communications between the police and fire, and everybody knows how to respond properly. And they've had some experience with this, and a lot of our folks have had experience with prior uh, instances of um, emergencies like this uh, with SARS and H1N1, whatever, the different things, Ebola. Um, the next phase for us is what we call the COOP, which is con con Continuity of Operations uh, Program Plan. And so we have our core teams, including IT, HR, finance, uh, DPW, all working along those realms, along with every department head who's, who's has a, will be, have, will, will, are expected to have a, a continuity of operations plan. And this is to make sure people get paid, you know, and we, if, if there's a, we are anticipating, you know, what happens if the worst, we're, we're worst case scenario planners. What if everybody in payroll is at the same party and they all come down with the flu or something like that, or whatever it is, and, and they're, and ice, they're, in, they're quarantined for two weeks. That's what the plan is. And do we have technology that allows folks to work from home and things like that? Another big element is communications. Uh, so that's where Dave Zomek is working closely with Brianna Sunred and with the school department in terms of making sure our communication to the outside world is really important. We want it funneled through one point of contact. We have uh, newspaper reporters and uh, people coming into town all the time looking for stories. We want our message to be consistent and um, measured and based on uh, subject matter experts like Julie Fetterman and Tim Nelson who are telling us what is, where should we be and what is the accurate information. We're looking, we have, we're looking at our programs, uh, LSSC, library, senior center, um, and making, we wanna be consistent uh, in terms of how we're, how we're messaging out. We don't want one department to go off and say, we're canceling programs or not canceling programs. We want, us, we want us as a team to be making a group decision based on science, which is what we're basing our things on, our, in our decisions on. Um, we, have, we, were, we reached out to our community partners, which includes the um, Chamber of Commerce, the Business Improvement District, our institutional partners, uh, high level communication with all of them, uh, to see what their needs are and to be able to work with them. We have um, a lot, we're working on uh, a special effort with our vulnerable po populations, seniors, uh, social service providers, shelter guests, non-English speakers, immigrant communities, uh, Center for Extended Care, Arbors, Ann Whalen, Clark House, Applewood, all the places that you anticipate and we're making contact at different levels uh, with them to make sure um, they're all, many are high, highly aware, but um, some people don't have the resources and we want to see if they, what resources they need. Um, so there's a lot of work being done, um, work meeting with empl town employees to answer their questions uh, because everybody has concerns uh, and, um, you know, what are our, our procedures if you are quarantined for two weeks and you don't have enough sick time? What's our, we have to make some decisions along those lines. So um, the first thing is we, we make some preliminary decisions. We meet with employees and people who are in the field and say, how does this sound to you? So we're actively managing that. Tonight, uh, while we're meeting, Amherst College announced that they were closing their um, school. Uh, effective March 16th, all students are asked to be off campus and not to return unless you can't, and they will make allowances for students to come back. So there's more and more of these types of decisions being made, and it's, it's, we don't know what's going to happen because no one makes in the, um, we don't want to be in the prediction business, um, but we, we want to be in the preparation business, and that's where we're expending an enormous amount of our staff time right now. So if people are a little bit late in getting back to you, I've told them this is top priority for us. Um, and, uh, you know, we, you know, communicating with uh, Rep, Rep. Dom and uh, Senator Comerford about what the state can do. One of the things that has come up with the council is how do we meet if we don't have a quorum or a, a, people have self-quarantine for whatever reason in the state 
law requires you to have a quorum in the room before you can meet. That's something the state could release us from. And you know, this, there's lots of little things like that. We were, you know, when we think about our water treatment operators, you know, can we do? We, we have to have a certain number of them on staff, you know, available at all times. And so DPW is thinking about, well, how do we do we sequester some? And you know, so there's lots of things in play, in anticipation of the worst. And we hope that it doesn't go there, but we want to be prepared if it does, because we have vital functions that we deliver to the public um, 24 hours a day, and we have to make, and that's our core mission. And that's where we are putting all of our efforts. So there's a whole lot more than that happening, um, but it's basically all hands on deck. And um, our goal is to make sure that we maintain our operations and serve the public uh, without um, delay and without uh, sort of, so nobody notices anything that it is, but um, we, want, we're, we want to be prepared in case there are some disruptions in service and we have to fill in the gaps. Are there questions? Yes, Dorothy. Well, now, do you feel that you were wrong when I wanted to put in the town manager's goals, handles emergencies well? <laughs> and you said, well, what if I don't have any? Then how do I grade myself? And I, I you know, you've just dealt with the election. You sent out um, really almost paramilitary reports on Blarney Day, uh, which were fun to get. You're going to handle this. And I have to tell you that what I tell um, my grandchildren is, and people who talk to me, I said, oh, we don't really have to worry too much because we have, we're in Massachusetts. We're a well-run state, and we live in Amherst. And Amherst is a well-run town. And don't worry, we'll be doing fine. And I do totally believe that. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Steve. So uh, regarding the coronavirus, Obviously, the health and safety and welfare of everyone that lives here and works here is, is um, paramount. So, but I want to pull two of the issues together, the census and the fact that we know that Amherst College students are being asked to stay home. Who knows what will happen with other organizations here? April 1st is census day, so. It's, I had not put those two together, have you? I'm, I'm working on the complete count committee with Brianna and our town clerk, and we're working with the Amherst College to make sure that the students are counted as a block of data that comes from the college rather than sending out individual forms to college students. Um, we're, we're trying to make sure that all the data that the census needs in order to count those students is included in what's sent, but we're working on that too. So maybe we should um, invite all the other evacuees to come to Amherst on April 1st. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not where you live on April 1st, it's where you spend the majority of your time. So, <laughs> but that's a really good point, you know. Yes, Darcy. I, I just have a couple questions about Amherst College. Are they, um, they're not coming back from spring break? And are they, is there, is it for the whole term or? Well, um, I t well, during the break, I spoke with a representative from Amherst College, and they they purposely didn't put an end date on it because they want to have the flexibility. Um, but they are prepared for it to be the rest of the academic year. And are the students? Um, do they have a protocol where they're working remotely, so the students are actually still going yes. to school, getting credit, et cetera? It's all on their website, but I mean, uh -huh. Mandy Joe may so, know more. As of last faculty meeting, which was Tuesday of last week, the administration told the faculty that the semester would be finished. If it needed to be finished remotely, they would find a way to finish it remotely with online classes and all of that. Um, so the intent is to finish the semester and complete it without losing the semester as of last Tuesday. And they've already been working on how to do that remotely. Yes, Evan. So this is related, and then it's going to be not. But um, so obviously, as Steve said, the health and safety and continued services is paramount. If the other thing that's been, I've been thinking of now that I've seen the Amherst College is closing, and I'm 
bracing for the potential that UMass could do the same as if you talk to any local business owner, they'll tell you the hardest time for them are the summer months mm -hmm. when the students are gone and we're potentially looking at an additional three months of what would be summer and what that could do economically to our commu community. So I'm glad you said you're partnering with the bid and chamber and, and I hope that's also being thought of that a lot of pe uh, if the students go, if UMass does, Amherst maybe they can withstand a little bit, but if UMass does go, that's going to be a significant economic hit to our community. Um, which then brings me back to another thing I'm curious about, which is uh, where are we on an economic development director? Okay. So just for my bit, you know, I went to a Chinese restaurant for dinner and then went to Amherst Cinema this weekend. I encourage everybody to do that. Um, <laughs> um, that's needed. And also the, the economic impact will be on the town as well. Uh, our water and sewer usage will be down. Our revenues therefore will be down. Um, you know, if, if things that produce revenue for us, ambulance runs and things like that will be down. So that type of thing, it has an impact across the economy um, for all, you know, all different levels. Uh, economic Development Director, we have a meeting with the chamber on Thursday. Um, so that's our last group to get, they've asked for us to, before we start to move on that, that we hear from them. So we plan on doing that on Thursday and then we're, we have a meeting on Friday to release the, um, the advertisement, the recruitment. Alyssa. I could follow up on that. Um, if TSO had already existed, would you have asked TSO or any other town counselor what they thought when it came to economic development director because we've had no input to this at all, but yet stakeholders in the community are being asked what they think about an economic development director. So I have had conversations with individual um, counselors who have expressed interest in this area. So if there are other counselors, I'm very willing to have any kind of conversation with anybody who knows that this is out there and would like to have a conversation about it. Okay. Aunt Mary Jo. I'm going to go back to the potential economic fallout of this um, COVID issue. Um, many states have declared state of emergencies. My understanding is n it's not always because of how many are infected in the state, but because it frees up a whole bunch of funding from the federal government. Do you know whether um, the state of Massachusetts is thinking that or whether it would be beneficial if, say, UMass closes, if Amherst College remains closed, if this town declared one, would that free up money for small businesses in this town from some sort of state or federal state of emergency? And should we be considering something like that if, for example, UMass goes ahead and potentially closes? Yeah, I think that's a little premature at this moment in time. I think that we take our lead from the state and if the governor declares a state of emergency, if we deem that it's something that we need to do or if it's something that we have to do in order to access uh, state or federal money and because I think the state, the, the federal government just appropriated $8.2 billion or something like that. So we want to get our share of that if there is some out there. Um, and that's certainly something we would look to do. Yeah. Are there other questions at this time? Oh, okay, just one. So uh, reference was made to the non-event this weekend. Um, which was a bigger event than it had been in the past. And um, there was, uh, well, again, well-managed, um, but uh, a little bit um, the same, we had the same police presence and response rate that we had in the past, but there, was, there were more um, arrests made than we had in the past, so. Alyssa? I just wanna say, not then ever, in the past, but certainly in the in the recent right. past, in the last few years, nice yeah. section where we've been so prepared. But the other thing I did just want to mention that if you could pass long term people, of course, we completely appreciate everything they did. And at the same time, I still get complaints about people driving through town feeling like they're driving through an armed camp. And I'm talking about adults, not students. So it's a very non Amherst-y feeling to have such a large police presence. And so it's just always good when we put out, I think it was it's really helpful, like you did, to put out the public releases, because then the public understands better like so, why we're doing this. And so they, they do, there's a lot of preparation that goes into this from the police department especially. Um, they gather everyone who's on the street in advance of the, um, meeting of, of the day. 
that morning, and they explained to them what the pro that the protocol is. We don't believe in zero tolerance. It's about presence and visibility. So we want people to notice people. We ask them to wear the yellow jackets. So it's we want it's about visibility and um, assisting people. It's not about you know trying to arrest as many people as possible. So that's the, you know, our officers get that, but it's the other seven forces that come into town that might not. And so we, we really, the um, Captain Ting, who is in charge of this operation, makes that explicitly clear about what, what the, the um, feeling is about in, in the way we approach things in Amherst, which is different than a lot of other communities. Um, but it is about presence and it's about um, letting everybody know that there, is, there are police available and um, large parties, super large parties, were not um, not something that we were encouraging. Sarah. So, as someone who lives on Meadow Street, I definitely noticed that the spirit was high on this non-event day, and um, we were we definitely we had a, a lot of uh, police officers on our street, but the tone was still jovial, and I definitely one of the things is I feel like. Um, I feel like it's just safer. Kids seem to be having fun, but I definitely felt better about their safety. And so the north end of town, that was, mm -hmm. was good. I appreciate it. Good. Good. Dorothy? Um, I have really want to know why the headliner, rapper, refused to go on. Was it the police presence? or I mean, because that's very titillating to read it in the paper and not to be given the reason why. I think you asked the university for what the reason was. I do not, I, I'm almost, it's not the police presence. Two, two other acts performed without incident. Okay. Any other, any other questions regarding the town manager's report? Okay. Um, President, uh, town council comments. Um, I've sent you something regarding the retreat, which we are still planning to have. Hang on. Uh, please let me know if you have comments about that. I've received comments from one counselor so far. Um, I also wanted to mention, following up on what Paula said, that Mandy Joe and I will also be following up with Paul about how we deal with meetings, et cetera. And um, I've already had one excellent suggestion from our clerk of the council regarding how we might accommodate public comments. So uh, we want to make sure that we're still visible to the public, but safe ourselves. Um, are there any other uh, future agenda items? Councilor comments. Okay, uh, topics not reasonably anticipated. Moving right along. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Done. <laughs>